And we can go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Thanks very much for joining. I'm Jeff Sale. Today, we'll be having a three and a half hour uh, tutorial on the Comet to Expanse transition. We have several presenters, uh, and I'm sure it's going to be a great presentation. Uh, before we get started, I would like to point out the Exceed Code of Conduct. Everyone is expected to be on their best behavior, but if anyone observes any uh, inappropriate conduct, uh, the links are here and you can reach out to exceed.org code of slash code of conduct for that. Uh, we would also like to emphasize that um, we're committed to providing training events that foster inclusion and show respect for all. Uh, this is a, a very important effort within the exceed training community to minimize the instances of uh, inappropriate documentation. And with that, I will go ahead and hand it off to Mary Thomas, who will be sort of the master of the proceedings. Take it away, Mary. Oh, not master. <laughs> Mary, you're muted. Uh, I am muted. I am now unmuted. So Jeff, you have those slides, right? If not, I will share. There we go, let's go to the next slide. So the goal of this um, tutorial or this workshop is to show you guys what you uh, are gonna have to do a bit differently on Expanse and there are some differences. The architecture is different. The operating system is, um, we're now using CentOS, but we're using Slurm, but the module environment's a little bit different. So today we'll just try and show you the new features on Expanse and get you familiar and, and um, uh, move on to the next slide, please, Jeff. So the next slide just shows our schedule. Um, and I'm not sure that it got posted to the website yet, but we'll start with Mahidar. He'll talk about an overview of Expanse and talk about Slurm. And then we'll have a, a short break and then we'll talk about modules and another break and then job charging and using the Expanse portal, a new, a new application uh, running on Expanse and um, interactive computing, and then we'll wrap up with data transfer mechanisms. If you have questions, type them into the chat. Um, we'll have people that are working and supporting the speakers to answer any questions you might have. Uh, and with that, um, let's start with Mahidar to um, do overview of systems and allocations. Thanks, Mary. Uh, start by sharing and hopefully we get the right desktop here. Okay. Can everyone see the slide okay? Yep, looks good. Great. So yeah, yeah I'll start off with a, a expand system overview and uh, and then go into, uh, in the second presentation, I'll go into how to run jobs on Expanse. So the outline of the talk, essentially uh, just introducing the system, look at the system uh, architecture, uh, specifically look at the AMD uh, Epic processor architecture, the hardware details, the NUMA options, and uh, uh, basically uh, how, how, how to use them and then uh, look at some of the innovative features in Expanse itself uh, and then talk about uh, allocations and uh, summarize what we look at. So Expanse uh, basically is a result of uh, an NSF award. Uh, it's basically uh, a category one capacity system. Uh, uh, the PI on the project is uh, Mike Norman and a lot, a lot of us co-PIs there. Uh, and then uh, Basically, the primary vendor for the system uh, is Dell, uh, Aon for the storage, and then we have uh, a lot of other uh, components, uh, processors from AMD, uh, uh, the Intel processors on the GPU node, uh, the host processor, the NVIDIA GPUs, and the Mellanox uh, interconnect. Uh, so it's a, a, a system that's made up of 13 scalable units. And uh, I'll go into a little detail on the each scalable unit in the next few slides. Uh, there are uh, 728 standard compute nodes, uh, 52 GPU nodes, and each GPU node has 
four GPUs, so you have a total of 208 GPUs. Uh, you have four large memory nodes. So if you uh, think about it, this is basically similar to uh, our setup on Comet. Uh, so it's based, you can almost uh, see the evolution coming from Comet to Expanse. Uh, in terms of the data, we have a 12 petabyte uh, luster file system, which can do about 140 gigabytes per second on uh, uh, writes and 200 kilo, uh, uh, 200K uh, IO operations per second uh, on the metadata side. Uh, actually, it's much greater than that. Uh, and then uh, uh, as we've had on a lot of the SDSC systems, we have node local NVMe storage uh, for fast IO uh, local storage. We are going to have a seven petabyte Ceph-based object store. Uh, this is not going to be available right at the beginning because uh, we are essentially going to re uh, restructure some existing storage. So that's going to show up uh, sometime next year, but that will be an additional storage option that will be available on Expanse. So the quick overview of the compute side and I mean of the system itself, we looked at uh, all the numbers. So overall it's uh, 93,000 compute cores. So you almost double the Comet uh, core count. Uh, and uh, based on the benchmarks we've run, we expect uh, close to, I mean, more than two, two X the throughput over Comet. Uh, most of the applications will see a per core improvement over Haswell. Uh, we see anywhere between uh, uh, even performance with uh, per core going out to almost 1.8x on some applications. So it really depends on the application. Uh, and since the nodes have uh, 128 cores, so on a per node basis, you're uh, gonna see a pretty large improvement in performance. Um, and then <clears throat> given the 2x core counts, uh, the throughput's easily gonna go over 2x. We expect uh, a smooth transition going from Intel to the AMD processors. Uh, we've compiled and run most of the common software packages, a uh, lot of benchmarking, and it seems good so far. And whatever feedback we've got from the early user testing kind of confirms that people seem to be happy with the system in terms of uh, running and compiling and uh, right now the system is an early user period as I mentioned. We expect produ production in November, uh, it should, I mean, should be pretty early November and uh, the operation is scheduled for five years. So let's go into the uh, rack dis scalable compute unit. So, uh, uh, as I mentioned, basically 13 scalable compute units. Overall, uh, we are looking, uh, uh, so let me go to the next slide actually. So each uh, SCCU is, is essentially designed uh, to have full bisection bandwidth uh, within the rack. So you have 56 compute nodes, uh, which amounts to a lot of cores. So it's 7,168 cores compared to Comet, which had uh, 1,700 cores in a rack. Uh, we also will have four GPU nodes in an SCCU uh, and all of it's uh, uh, connected through with our HDR switch. The HDR switch has, uh, it's a 200 gig uh, HDR switch. So um, what we are doing is splitting the cables uh, to get 100 HDR 100 to each uh, of the compute and GPU nodes. So what that does is uh, gives you the 60 connections down uh, to the nodes and then 20 uh, go, uh, and then 10, uh, 200 gigs going up. So it's uh, effectively works out to a three to one over subscription. Each of these standard compute nodes is two AMD EPIC 7742 processors, uh, 2.25 gigahertz. Uh, they are 128 uh, Zen 2 CPU cores essentially. Uh, and it features PCI Gen 4, uh, uh, 256 gigs of RAM on each uh, node, and uh, that's uh, DDR4 3.2 gigahertz, I think, and a terabyte of NVMe. So you got a lot more space per node, but you also have a lot more cores per node. So uh, something to keep in mind when you're uh, running is to use the local scratch if you 
uh, if you have an IOPS heavy workload. Uh, on the GPU nodes, we have four NVIDIA V100s. Uh, it's uh, 32 gig G, uh, GDDR on each uh, V100 GPU. Uh, 1.6 terabytes of NVMe. Uh, as I mentioned, there are Intel CPUs on uh, on the GPU node. Uh, and then uh, going, out, going out to the network diagram, you can see basically you have 56 compute nodes four GPU nodes, and then the uplink of 10x, uh, 200 gigs. Uh, overall, the network uh, plugs into uh, a lot of the external fast uh, networks uh, listed out there, so uh, which is similar to what we had on uh, Expanse, but we have a 25 gig uh, connection on each uh, compute node, so you can get quite a bit of external connectivity. So next, let's look at the AMD EPIC processor architecture. Uh, so it has uh, eight core complex dies. So if you look at the picture on the right, uh, you have uh, each of these CCDs has eight cores essentially. Uh, and there is a, a, a IO die in the center, which is at 14 nanometers and the CCDs were at seven nanometers. So this kind of an innovative design lets them uh, uh, pack in a lot more cores and uh, uh, and the I through the iodi uh, there are uh, multiple ways of kind of uh, booting up this node in terms of new domains and I'll talk about that uh, in the slides coming up uh, so each of those core complex dice so this uh, picture on the next slide is one of these green CCD uh, the CD, CCDs in that diagram. So there are two core complexes on each of them. And each core complex has four Zen 2 cores, which share an L3 cache of 16 meg. There's a lot of L3 cache on this machine, so it's 256 megabytes of L3 cache total. Uh, each uh, core also has a private L2 cache of 512 kilobytes. And uh, yeah. So, so now you can kind of uh, see that there is a hierarchical setup there. Basically, you have the iodi, you have the uh, CPUs uh, split off into the CCDs, and then each CCD has two core complex dies with the uh, affinity. Uh, I mean, with the shared L3 caches. So, in terms of how these can be booted up, there are several options, but uh, you can essentially do NUMA domains on each socket, so multiple NUMA domains. And for the HPC workloads, the best option is to do an NPS4, which is based four NUMA domains per socket. And the way this works is uh, the processor is partitioned into four NUMA domains. So you have two CCDs and two memory channels in each of the uh, NUMA domains. Uh, this lets you, uh, if you do the binding right, you can kind of uh, get scaling out to all four, uh, like uh, the full socket uh, uh, because of the memory channels being uh, split this way. Uh, the PCI devices will be local to one of these NUMA domains. And uh, uh, so the network card could be on one of them, for example. So, uh, so the main thing to keep in mind is that uh, there is some complexity in the uh, in NUMA domains. Uh, so this is just on one socket, remember. So you, when you have two sockets, that gives you another level of uh, non-uniform memory, right? So you, you have to be really careful when you're running uh, jobs on the system uh, to be binding and using the layouts the right way. Uh, so there are uh, several uh, compilers available on the system. So we've tested applications with AOCC, GNU, and Intel compilers. And with MPI versions, we've got MVAPIX2, OpenMPI, and Intel MPI. Uh, right now, we don't have any defaults because what we found is, uh, depending on the applications, different sets of compilers work better for some and worse for others, kind of. So you, uh, you should like test out things. For the applications we are installing ourselves, we 
primarily uh, stuck to the GCC compilers uh, and then used AOCC uh, where appropriate, where it was better performing basically. Uh, this is a moving target as what I would say, because there's a lot of optimizations going on on these processes and uh, we are uh, involved with a uh, lot of different uh, 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 sites which are uh, running uh, AMD processors and also with AMD themselves uh, developing application recipes. So things might change, but uh, you have a lot of options right now. Uh, so as I mentioned, at runtime, it's very important to uh, bind correctly. So you can, for MPI jobs, basically use a pin domain if it's Intel MPI or if it's Open MPI, just do the mapping. Uh, you can also use slum uh, directives to, uh, uh, slum options to essentially bind the right way. Uh, and we are actually developing some of some tools uh, to, to help out. Uh, especially for pthreads codes uh, and for hybrid uh, MPI open MP cases. So we will have an uh, IB run and an affinity script uh, available. So the type of applications we've uh, run on Expanse, we've uh, uh, gone through quite a few benchmarking uh, efforts, basically run uh, uh, Chromax, NAMD, Neuron, OpenFOAM, uh, Quantum Espresso, Raxamal, WRF, and so you can see there's a broad uh, uh, yeah, range of uh, applications that we've tested and kind of different application areas, all kinds of combinations. Overall, what we've seen is performance range is matching on a per core basis to almost 1.8x faster on a per core basis. Uh, on the GPU side, we've uh, uh, Benchmark some of the MD uh, MD codes like NAMD and Amber, and uh, also a lot of the machine learning kind of codes. Uh, what we've seen is greater than 1.5x per GPU improvement over the Comet P100 nodes, and for some codes it's closer to 2x. It's 1.85 to 2x per Amber, for example. So that actually uh, uh, brings me to the GPU uh, node architecture. So it's uh, four V100s, uh, as I mentioned, 32 gigs on each V100 uh, GPU. The, the host node itself has basically 384 gigabytes of RAM and 1.6 terabytes of PCIe and BME. And the processors on the uh, node are Intel Xeon 6248s, which are basically cascade legs. Uh, and if you look at the topology, uh, you can see uh, that the four GPUs are split between the two sockets and uh, uh, the numbering is uh, odd even in terms of uh, all the even numbers are on one socket and the odd numbers on the other socket. So you can see the uh, numbering there. And then uh, uh, you have uh, NV link between the GPUs. So that is a difference from Comet. So on Comet, uh, if you had to talk between two GPUs on different sockets, you would have to go through the uh, host uh, CPU and through across. But now uh, with NVLink, you should have much better uh, performance, I think. So uh, in terms of software stack, we'll so support a pretty broad application base. We are trying to replicate what's on Comet with uh, a lot of the packages uh, we like commonly use packages in bioinformatics, molecular, molecular dynamics, machine learning, quantum chemistry, structural mechanics, visualization. We'll try to get things on. Uh, you may not have your favorite package on day one, but we can definitely work to install uh, as people come on come online. We have a pretty big chunk of it replicated already, so. Uh, Today's talks basically are aimed at informing you about like basically the differences going between Comet uh, to the Expanse application environment. Marty is going to talk a lot about the uh, modules and the setup. Uh, for those who are curious, uh, the main uh, mechanism for installs we are using is, uh, is PAC. Uh, this lets us uh, leverage a lot of the work that's been going on in the community, SPAC community to uh, and uh, develop a lot of the HPC software stack. And 
uh, AMD has its own uh, fork of the SPAC uh, base and they are uh, putting in performant uh, application uh, uh, packages into that. So that's an ongoing effort. So as things become available, we, we'll update them with the AMD version so that we get the best performance. Uh, we will continue to support uh, singularity-based containerization on Expanse, just like uh, on Comet. So if, uh, so if you've been using containers on Comet, you can do the same on Expanse. Uh, so some other, uh, 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 so Expanse, in, in, in addition to the standard way of, uh, uh, you know, the standard compute nodes and GPU nodes and the slum based scheduling also has uh, a few innovative features. So we have an option to integrate with public crowds. Uh, it of course needs a lot of work. So this is uh, something that would uh, be done uh, essentially uh, on a project basis and uh, will require some interaction with SDSC. So it's not a push button kind of uh, thing. Uh, but we have demonstrated this with work on Comet, and we are going to uh, replicate that on uh, on uh, Expanse. Basically, uh, we you would be able to use uh, Slum to submit your job, and then uh, there's a whole infrastructure to make that work seamlessly, so that you end up running the job on a cloud resource. Uh, so early work was kind of used for. Uh, uh, running Cypress jobs from the gateway. Uh, this, this approach is uh, cloud agnostic and kind of will aim to support most of the cloud providers. Uh, uh, so, the, uh, so there are options behind in the back end. Basically, you have to look at data movement, data in cloud, um, uh, lots of different things to look at. So. If you're interested, uh, this is uh, something uh, that you would have to uh, request uh, additional support for. Uh, similarly, we are also looking at uh, composable systems. Uh, this is so that we can expand uh, beyond the boundaries of uh, what's available on, uh, on Expanse as hardware. So for example, uh, you may have some pieces that are available on Expanse, some pieces that are available on a public cloud or a different resource. Uh, and what we what we are trying to do on Expanse is to be able to carve out some of the nodes using uh, and set, set up a Kubernetes cluster on that and then uh, uh, basically federate with other Kubernetes uh, uh, resources outside of the system. Uh, again, this is going to be uh, uh, needing uh, like a little more advanced support. So you would need to request that uh, uh, as part of an XRAC request and also make sure uh, that there is a case to do it. So this is not something you'd want to do lightly. It's more if you, if you have a workflow that actually needs something like this, then uh, you can definitely make this happen. Uh, so then uh, in terms of uh, the rest of the uh, uh, support mechanism, so we have uh, the stand, it's, it, Expanse is gonna be integrated as uh, an Exceed level one resource. So uh, you can have the support coming through the Exceed ticketing system as uh, you had on Comet. Uh, in terms of uh, transitioning, uh, we have an overlap of six months between Comet and Expanse or rather now it's five months. <laughs> but uh, quite a bit of overlap. So uh, we can definitely work on the transition with a lot of users. Uh, and today's workshop is essentially the first uh, in, a, uh, in, in a set that basically will help you transition from Comet to Expanse. Uh, as I mentioned, you'll have advanced support available for uh, cloud integration and composable systems. We're also uh, starting a new program, the HPC at MSI, uh, targeted at minority serving institutions. So we, we can award some discretionary time that lets, lets people uh, get on the system in a rapid fashion. Uh, and we'll support uh, uh, such projects. Uh, so in terms of allocations, uh, 
expense is our, it will show up as a resource right now on exceed extract windows so if you're uh, looking to submit proposals that's one of the options so uh, there are three resources that are related to expense uh, uh, there's uh, the expense cpu basically which is the allocations on the compute uh, part of the system expands uh, GPU, which is basically allocations on the GPU v100 parts of the system. And then we have allocated project storage. Uh, these are allocations on the Luster file system, essentially. Uh, and the file system is available on all the nodes of the system. Note that it's a single file system that's split between scratch and projects. Uh, so the total allocated space uh, that we can do on the project side is uh, at least at this point as of, uh, around five petabytes. And note that we will have a per project limit of 50 uh, terabytes uh, to begin with so that, uh, you know. So in terms, and uh, I should add that any storage allocations have to be justified you know, in terms of why you need that for the duration of a project. So it's meant to essentially keep data uh, uh, for a, basically files that you that you expect to need for the duration of a project. So any scratch space should just go uh, into the scratch section of the file system. Uh, I have a few snapshots uh, of uh, the allocations page, uh, basically how you can log in and where the uh, expanse uh, options are basically we'll see the expanse Dell cluster with AMD ROM and then the GPU and the storage piece. Uh, so to summarize, basically uh, expanse will provide a huge increase in performance and throughput compared to the Comet uh, machine. And it's essentially an evolution of the Comet design uh, with some innovations in uh, cloud integration and composable systems. And so some of that work was started earlier and kind of continued uh, into, evolved into the production side of uh, Expanse, essentially. Uh, we will have integration with Open Science Grid. So that's another uh, piece that would uh, allow jobs on the machine. Uh, and uh, we looked at this, the the architecture of the system, basically the 728 compute nodes and 52 GPU nodes and the HDR100 interconnect on the nodes. As I mentioned, it's gonna go production uh, in a couple of weeks essentially. And uh, you can follow all things expanse at this website. So I think that puts me right at uh, almost 11.30. So you can probably do a few minutes of questions. see if I can pick out the chat. I'm going to stop sharing and look at the chat to see if there are questions. Yeah, Marty and Trevor have been handling it except for the last question. There's a question specifically about the project storage. So Ron, you had a thing that you have projects, but the directory is different than the directory. Yeah, I think the question um, about the project storage is it's, it's possible. I mean, these, these, these directories are created manually right now. So okay. it's possible yeah. we just, if you're, if you're already on the system as part of the early user um, uh, access program, um, maybe we have not created it for it. So if you want to send us a ticket, that would be uh, probably the best way to go about that. And I think, Paul, there was a question on uh, your question on Globus. Yes, we have a exceed pound expands endpoint setup. So you can use that for uh, Globus transfers. And we have enabled sharing on that uh, in on specific directories. So you can also do Globus sharing if you're on that endpoint. So Mahid Har, can I ask a question? Sure, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, could you give me a little bit more explicit sense of how um, a, a Comet uh, research allocation right now transfers 
uh, to expands. I mean, I would just assume that like within a couple of weeks, if we have a research allocation on Comet, we'll be able to run on expands. Is, is, that, is that right? Uh, no, actually that's not true. So what we are doing is uh, there are, people have actually asked for expands explicitly in their allocations. Uh, because this has been available in an allocation cycle for a while. I think it's been available the last two allocation cycles. So there are actually people with uh, expands allocations specifically. Uh -huh. For Comet users who, uh, who have an allocation that goes beyond the end date of Comet, which is true for a lot of people, we will transfer them to uh, expands when we get closer to the end date of Comet. Now you can always... Uh, uh, request a transfer from Comet to Expands if you would like to use Expands, and that is totally fine. Or you could ask for a supplement on Expands, and that is also fine. I see. In it but we are not to, automatically to make... transitioning every Comet allocation to Expands, if that's the question. <laughs> okay, good, good. And so that that kind of transfer is uh, how you, how you do that is found under. Uh, so it's uh, like a regular under... exceed a transfer between resources. Okay, great. Thank you. So I think uh, there was a question about whether there's a purge cycle for Scratch. Yes, <laughs> we're going to have a 90-day purge from create time. So uh, it's uh, and the project space is where you would keep something that you need for the longer term. Yeah, that, that is for the duration of a uh, allocation. I should say both the locations are not backed up. So if you have critical data, we always urge you to make offsite backups of anything that's critical. All right, so I think I I will transition to the next talk, which is running jobs on expanse. So let me go to the front of this thing and start sharing again. So Again, the, the, for completeness, I have a system overview and uh, uh, again in this uh, slide deck, just in case somebody uh, picks up this slide deck uh, offline. Uh, so I have a system overview and then we'll just look at the login info. And uh, after that, what I'm essentially focusing on in this talk is looking at the Slurm scheduler, the partition info and how things are a little different then comment and how things are similar in some cases. Uh, then we'll uh, look at just uh, running jobs examples for MPI, OpenMP, MP, uh, hybrid cases and GPU jobs. Uh, I'll go over the file systems a little bit and also um, give you some example scripts uh, to, to use local scratch usage. Uh, so let me go that. So that was the architecture thing I was talking about. So since we just went through that, I can uh, uh, quickly go over it in case somebody just joined. So basically, uh, Expanse has 13 scalable units, uh, 728 compute nodes with about 93,000 plus cores, uh, and then 52 GPU nodes, which have four N uh, V100s connected with NVLink. Uh, it's for a total of 208 V100 uh, GPUs. There is HDR100 connectivity into the node, and then uh, the switches at the top of the rack for each of these uh, uh, racks, uh, there are basically HDR200 switches. So overall, we get a 3 to one over sub subscription between the nodes. Uh, so let me skip through that. So logging into Expanse. Uh, this is basically very similar to what you're doing on uh, Comet. Uh, uh, the allocations are different for CPU and GPU resources, just like on Comet. Uh, so like when you get an exceed allocation, you would have a separate allocation for each. However, the login node is the same. So you can log in to login.expanse.stsc.edu. Uh, uh, so if you have an SSH client, uh, uh, you can just directly SSH uh, using basically uh, your username 
uh, oh, I actually, I think I missed one question on the previous talk where somebody asked about uh, if the allocation IDs will be the same. Uh, if your project is the same, yes, it'll look, uh, it'll be the same, uh, but uh, there is a tool, and I think Nicole's gonna talk about it, which basically lets you uh, get information on uh, uh, what your allocations are. So anyway, uh, and your user, and the reason this came up to me is basically the username is also basically going to be the same as what you had on Comet. Uh, so you can uh, directly log in and use your Exceed Portal password, or uh, uh, and this will basically put you on one of the two login nodes: login zero one dot expands dot edu and login zero two dot expands dot edu. Both nodes are identical. Uh, you can also log in via the single exceed single sign on host, so login.exceed.org. So you can basically SSH with your exceed portal username to the login.exceed.org, which has two factors. So if you've got your two factor set up with Duo there, you should be able to log in there and then GSI SSH to uh, login.expans.sdsc.eu. One other new thing on uh, uh, on Expanse is uh, we will have an Expanse user portal and Subha is gonna talk about that later today. Uh, so that's another mechanism of uh, accessing Expanse. You can uh, uh, basically submit jobs from that uh, user portal. You can also use some of the interactive uh, 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 programs through that. And uh, there's more details coming in Subha's talk there. Uh, you can use SSH keys uh, uh, to, to essentially uh, enable access from uh, uh, authorized hosts uh, without having to uh, enter your password. But uh, be make, make sure that you have a strong passphrase on the private key on your local machine and don't copy that key around. <laughs> keep, keep it on your local machine and you can always do uh, 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 you can use SSH agent to uh, avoid repeatedly typing the private key password on your end, but oh, whatever you do, don't do a passwordless thing because that's a huge security problem. And uh, uh, and if you are, uh, for some reason, uh, like say have a programmatic thing that connects uh, 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 via SSH uh, very frequently, you uh, we, we do have a, uh, a limit on that and you might get blocked for a little bit. But uh, if you do have this use case, please uh, email us so we can give you an option that lets you uh, avoid the problem. Uh, and there's a security webinar that uh, Scott did a little bit ago that kind of goes into some of these things from a comment perspective, but most of that applies on uh, Expanse too. So the first thing is uh, the appropriate use of login nodes. So login nodes are meant for like file editing, simple data management, like uh, you know moving files around or uh, copying some small files uh, remotely, that's okay. But uh, main thing is you should use, be using minimal compute resources. So don't run uh, jobs on the login node, even if they're meant to be short, uh, because if 10 of you do that, that's enough to slow the login node down. So uh, please avoid running on the login node. Uh, and then all computationally demanding jobs, even if they're interactively run, should be going through the batch queuing system. So don't use it for anything computing computationally intensive. Uh, don't use them to run some intensive workflow management tool because that's gonna cause problems too. Uh, uh, and essentially, uh, if you're doing some data transfer, if it's a small amount, that's okay. But if not, please use one of our data mover nodes for doing any intensive data transfers. And preferably you should use Globus for the big transfers because uh, it'll give you an efficient way into the system. Uh, and do not run Jupyter Notebooks on the login node. And Mary's gonna talk a little bit about how to uh, run those uh, appropriately. And also don't set up servers on the login node that uh, provide services to the outside world because that could lead to issues too. Uh, 
the one other big difference I think between Comet and Expanse is uh, the GPU nodes, as you may remember from the earlier talk, basically have different CPUs. So if you're doing compilations uh, on the, for the GPU nodes, it's best to request an interactive session uh, and do a compilation uh, since this whole CPU is different. The other thing that's different is the stack on the, the software stack for the GPUs is different from the software stack for, for the CPUs. So, uh, so that's another reason to essentially get a, um, GPU node allocation and then do the uh, compiles there. So in terms of scheduling, so Expanse uses Slurm just like uh, Comet. Uh, it's a much newer version of Slurm. So there are additional features and additional uh, strict enforcement of uh, uh, limits and so on. So, uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, but the usual Slurm commands will work. So submit jobs using S batch. Uh, you can check your jobs using SQ. Uh, I encourage people to use the dash U option so that you're not querying everyone's jobs at the same time. Uh, that thing slows things down and also causes an additional load on the scheduler. Uh, it's easier for it to deal with specific uh, requests. So. And if you want to cancel a job, uh, you can use the s cancel command. So let's look at what's uh, similar to Comet and what's different from Comet in terms of the partition. So just like Comet, we are going to support both exclusive and shared partition. Uh, so uh, in terms of what's uh, common uh, with Comet, like you have uh, the compute partition, which is essentially CPU nodes exclusive access. One real thing to <laughs> keep in mind is if you make a mistake and put a shared, like a two core job on a compute node, there's a huge cost to it. So please be careful in terms of how many cores you need. And if you really need the 128 cores from the compute uh, partition, because you will go through your SUs real quick if you uh, make a mistake when run on the compute partition. And we've seen this happen on Comet and it was, uh, we typically catch the that, but uh, yeah, it can lead to uh, a much bigger penalty in this case because of the higher core count. Uh, and uh, we obviously can't refund that because this jo the jobs are blocked, uh, blocking those resources when you do that. Uh, in terms of uh, shared partition, so these are the shared partition is for CPU nodes uh, that uh, and for jobs that need less than 128 cores. Uh, and uh, similarly on the GPU side, we have the GPU nodes with exclusive access in the GPU partition and then the GPU shared partition if you need less than four GPUs. Uh, and uh, just like Comet, we have a large shared partition for the large memory nodes uh, and a debug partition for short tests and quick access. So what's new on Expanse? So a few things. One is uh, there's a GPU debug partition, which I know will make a lot of users happy because it was one of the things that was asked for a lot on Comet. So we do have a GPU debug partition. So this is essentially for short tests and compilation tasks. Uh, we also have preempt partitions, which basically discount uh, uh, discount the SUs used, and, and uh, so that you can run on the nodes if they're free. But the jobs can be preempted by jobs in other partitions, like compute or shared, for example. Similarly, we have a GPU preempt partition. Mahidar, can I jump in here for a moment? Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of activity on the chat and it can be a challenge for some of our okay. attendees to be tracking both at the same time. So if you have a minute or two, can you review briefly what's been going on? Some of it has already been covered by you, but you know, the questions. Okay. Let me go back there. Uh, I might have to stop sharing and go back to the thing. Okay. Uh, let's see. So I think there was a comment about uh, 
switching to node hours on the SU definition. I think the reason we didn't do that is because of the shared partitions, basically. Uh, because then you would end up with fractional SUs, which uh, I don't think we are set up to deal with right now. Uh, and then, uh, So there's a question about memory usage being enforced for shared nodes. Uh, yes, it is. And I, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit further down. Yeah. So there was a question about uh, the transfers basically going between uh, Comet to Expanse. Uh, so if, uh, if you're intending to transfer basically uh, in the March timeframe, uh, you don't really have to do that because we're gonna do that. I, that transfer comment was more meant for people who want to immediately use uh, time on expanse since we are not automatically moving the comment time right away. So if someone has comment time today and wants to uh, use expanse mid November, they would like, they would have to put a transfer in. So yeah, I'm not sure how much more more time we need to spend on that, um, okay. but appreciate taking a, a bit of a moment for people to get caught up on both. Oh yeah, sure. I, I think hopefully everyone's caught up. And yeah, and, yeah. and Marty and Trevor have been doing a great job. Thanks. Uh, so back to the partition. So uh, uh, so this slide basically, and Nicole's going to cover this again uh, when she does the charging aspect of it. Uh, but basically what we have- uh, Hey, Mahi, you need to share your slides. Oh, huh. hold on, thanks. <laughs> All right, that's good. Looks good now? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, yeah, so uh, this is a quick overview of basically the limits. So we have a 48 hour limit just like on Comet uh, on the partitions by, by default. Uh, so some of the uh, limits are, so one thing I should say is that these limits are what we kind of uh, thought of uh, looking at like the performance numbers and kind of this, uh, the sizes of the jobs that uh, typically run and we kind of put those in. Uh, but they are flexible, and if it turns out that some of these might need to change, they will be changed. But right now, this is, these are the limits we are going in with. So the max number of nodes you can request on a compute partition is uh, 32. So that gives you basically 4,096 uh, uh, cores. Uh, and so that's quite a bit more than what you had on Comet in terms of number of cores per job that you can run. Uh, and so you can have a maximum of the 64 uh, uh, nodes running uh, uh, your particular group's jobs. And the reason uh, uh, we have these limits is because 64 nodes is essentially nearly 10% of the system. So we are trying to balance the system uh, out for all the users. Uh, so, uh, so the, similarly on the shared compute side, uh, we have the equivalent of 32 nodes essentially if you run one core. Uh, so you, you one single core jobs essentially. So you will end up with 4096 as the max uh, running jobs. Similar things on GPU side, uh, we have a max of four nodes uh, per uh, for a GPU job. Uh, Remember these are V100 nodes, which are quite a bit faster than what we had on Comet. So equal, this is equivalent to like eight nodes, I think on a, a Comet uh, side. So that's where we came up with the limit, but this is something that may change it depending on uh, what the utilization looks like and uh, uh, how the QA times look like. Uh, one thing I should note is that the GPU nodes have already been fully allocated based on what I've seen of the allocation requests so far. So, uh, so these these will be busy, I think. Uh, and then uh, on the debug partition, we have a max of two nodes per job, and the two nodes is just so you can test an MPI job essentially. Uh, we 
they uh, deliberately kind of uh, stuck a low uh, run limit on the uh, number of jobs because uh, on Comet we have noticed people kind of trying to game the debug <laughs> queue a little bit and use and uh, roll through a lot of jobs. So we have a lower limit. Uh, and as I mentioned, we have the GPU debug partition now. So a few other things, basically uh, on the expanse uh, 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 scheduler side, uh, uh, we have a few required part parameters. So first thing is the partition, the dash P option or the dash dash partition option. Uh, we, we would like you to put that in explicitly uh, on Comet. I think we defaulted to compute. So uh, this is something you would want to put in. Uh, you would need a number of nodes and the number of tasks per node or the number of n tasks, right? One of the two needs to be specified. The Swarm will pick n tasks if you uh, specify that. And uh, the wall clock time, uh, it should be specified uh, uh, explicitly. And then uh, two other things. One is the account, unlike Comet, we are not going to pick a default. So you will have to explicitly set this account uh, 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 on expanse. And then on the GPU side, uh, if you remember on Comet, we were setting uh, dash dash Gress. So on uh, expanse, it's a dash dash GPU, which is the total number of GPUs needed by the job. Uh, one other critical thing to note, and this goes to, I think, Kenneth's question on uh, memory. So dash dash mem, dash dash mem, CPU or GPU, one of these parameters, they're not required. However, uh, the default is quite low. It's one gigabyte uh, per core. So it is recommended basically to explicitly request this, even on exp uh, compute and GPU partition. So you're not gonna get 248 gigs on the compute partition if you don't ask for it. Uh, uh, so uh, and this version of Slurm is quite uh, strict with all the, uh, I mean, the we have configured it, it's quite strict with basically enforcing all the limits, including uh, uh, like the topology of your request. And I'll talk about that in, in a bit, but uh, this is a big change. So you kind of need to uh, get in the habit of requesting some uh, memory parameter. So it could be mem or mem per CPU or mem per GPU. So uh, I'll start off with the interactive jobs and you can do S run uh, just as you did on uh, Comet uh, and that will give you interactive access to the compute nodes and then you can run through the scheduler, whatever you need to. Uh, so uh, again, one uh, thing that I added in red here is basically you need to specify the account. So let's go into some sample uh, scripts to see if anything's different essentially compared to a uh, comment. So simple hello world MPI job here. So uh, if you look at the parameters, uh, most of them are pretty standard, right? You have the job name, you have the output file. Usually we tag that with the job ID and the uh, name of the first primary compute node so that it's easier to track down issues uh, later for us. Like, so we recommend doing that because uh, if you have a problem with a job, the first thing we ask you is what was the job ID? So <laughs> it's nice if it's in the output files name. Uh, and then, uh, uh, yeah, you have the partition, the num number of nodes and the task per node in this case, you could do end task if you want. And uh, I highlighted the memory per CPU. So in this case, I put in uh, 1800 megabytes. So it's 1.8 gig essentially roughly per uh, per uh, task in this, per CPU in this case. And then the account, as I mentioned, is a required quantity. Now, uh, I'm not going to go into the environment piece a little uh, so much, but uh, since Marty is going to talk about it, but in your job scripts, uh, uh, I think you should get in the habit of uh, basically uh, starting off clean and loading exactly what you need. Uh, so do this in your job script instead of, instead of your bash RC, especially on expanse because uh, the GPU nodes and CPU nodes are different stacks and you can't really load both of them in the 
uh, bash rc so do not put any module logs in your bash rc unless you're absolutely sure that uh, that's not going to conflict with something else you're trying to do in the batch script um, so uh, so in this case basically as you can see uh, i'm purging and now one other difference and i should have made this red and i will in the final slides uh, is you do have to load the slum module so slum is not in your default path uh, like it's on comet so you will have to load that module uh, and that is needed if you want to use a command like srun uh, in your uh, mpi job for example uh, and also for uh, uh, mpi runs because they are integrated with the scheduler so you would need the module load slum. And then you the module load CPU here, what it does is sets the module path to the CPU stack, essentially. Uh, so as I mentioned, it's different on the two sides, so you have to load that explicitly. And then it's like the usual, like you're loading a GCPZ compiler and an open MPI compiler here. Uh, so we are doing, uh, uh, S run here to launch this MPI job. Uh, you could also use MPI run. I have a different example for that. Uh, but one thing I should note is that uh, right now we only support, uh, actually we will only support uh, MPI launch mechanisms that are integrated with the scheduler. Uh, this is because on a shared node, uh, if we do an SSH based thing, it could get real complicated. So, so, so Remember that you have to go through uh, the scheduler either way, either if it's an S run or an MPI run that's integrated. So uh, the one other thing is basically, uh, so let's look at an open MP job and then I'll talk about this piece. So you can do partition equals shared, nodes equals one and task per node one and CPUs per task 16. Now here I should caution, this is again different from Comet. So on Comet, you could have done n task for node 16 and then launched an open MP job and it would pick up the 16 cores. But on expands, you probably will end up bound to one core if you do that. So explicitly ask for what you need. So, so in this case, we're saying it's just an open MP job. It's going to have one primary uh, task and then it will spawn 16 threads. So what we are saying is do n task per node is one, oops, and CPUs per task is 16. Uh, and then I'm basically doing a similar thing, uh, setting up the environment and then setting the open MP threads to 16 that matches the CPUs per task and then run the code. So for hybrid open MP and MPI jobs, I want to go back to that NPS4 thing. So because uh, as, as I mentioned, you're basically partitioning into four new do no domains in there. And the memory is interleaved on the two channels there. So if you're doing hybrid jobs, it's important that you try to uh, fit your jobs in a way that basically lays out the OpenMP tasks in the same NUMA domain and doesn't cross domains all over. So, so it's very important for hybrid jobs essentially. Uh, and we are uh, developing an IB run script, which should be available when machine goes into production. So you can use IB run uh, uh, with options so that uh, this happens under the covers for you. But it's important to remember this if you're writing your own way of uh, launching jobs or uh, scripts that uh, you are developing. So because it could make a pretty big performance difference if you cross uh, new model domains in, in this uh, architecture. Uh, so I have a couple of hybrid uh, MPI open MP uh, uh, examples. Let me take a quick look at the time how we are doing. So I have till twelve fifteen, right? Correct. Okay. And so you're doing should... fine, I think. Okay. Yeah, I think we are doing okay. Uh, okay. So. Uh, this is an example of a hybrid case. So basically you can see this is a shared partition job uh, with one node and two tasks per node. And then I'd set CPUs per task is 16. So you will have two MPI tasks and 16 threads on each of them. And so I do the export here and I'm doing a basically a pin domain on uh, uh, 
uh, uh, option with the Intel MPI, which lets you say that, hey, you have an open MPE set up here with the compact uh, uh, pinning uh, that, that we want to do. So that lets you kind of uh, uh, lay out the tasks the right way. Now you can do other things like spreading and all, uh, all the options are available and you can look at it. But uh, what we have seen with codes on, uh, uh, at least the ones we have tested so far, is that it's good to align with the L3 cache that's being shared on the four cores. Uh, so if you can uh, do your open MP thread so that the four of those threads are on one CCX, that will work well. This is another example, basically similar setup, uh, but now I'm using uh, OpenMPI, so I'm doing a different uh, thing. And here you can see I'm doing a map by L3 cache uh, option there. Uh, so uh, the next, uh, next thing I want to look at is uh, GPU nodes. Uh, and then compare it to what we were doing on Comet. So uh, the partition is GPU shared, which was similar to what we had on Comet. And I'm doing a nodes equals one and does equal, per node equals one the account and all that's okay. The difference here is now I'm doing a dash dash GPUs equals one, uh, which is different from Comet where you would have done dash dash gress equals GPU colon one. Uh, and I'll talk about the multi-node thing where it the difference shows up. So in this case, this was a um, uh, open ACC job uh, on, on the GPU node. So I'm purging everything, loading PGI, which has the open ACC support and running the job. Uh, so the multi-node job is a little different again from Comet. So what you have is uh, nodes equals four and task per node equals four. In this case, I'm basically matching the no number of tasks with the MPI uh, uh, with the number of GPUs. Not necessary to do this, and just a, as an example with uh, CPUs per star, task set to 10. So you have 40 total cores on the node. Uh, and then I'm basically setting the dash dash GPUs equals 16. So this is different, right? We are not setting uh, something equals four like you would have done on Comet where it was a per node basis here. This is the total number of GPUs. So you're requesting there. And then the rest of it is similar. Yeah, you can use SRUN to launch an MPI job. So uh, the last piece I want to kind of go into is the file systems. So uh, uh, when you log in, you're on your home file system. Uh, basically, dollar home uh, will also get you there. Uh, the home directory is limited in space. Like I said, it should only be used for like source code binaries and maybe small input files. Uh, and uh, you can have your job script here, but uh, make sure that the job script is aware that uh, it's not writing into the home directory, but writing into a Lustre or a local scratch for the actual IO. Uh, you have a quota of 100 gigs on the home file system. And, uh, and can't stress this enough, don't run any intensive IO tool from the home file system. This is not set up for high performance. So it's not the place for anything intensive. Uh, like I said, you could have like simple, like, you know, standard out kind of output go there, that should be okay. But uh, if you have any parallel IO or, uh, you know, file per core IO that does large scale stuff, you should move to Luster or local scratch. So talking of Luster, so we have uh, basically, that should be a singular there. It's a parallel one file system. So it's a global parallel file system with 12 petabytes uh, and it's available on all the nodes. Uh, there are two locations on this one file system. So it's important to remember it's a single file system. Uh, the expanse Luster scratch uh, dollar user, uh, which we will purge for files older than 90 days based on create date and the Luster projects location, which is the Expanse Luster projects uh, group ID. So uh, what we are doing here is since it's the same file system, we set a user based quota, quota uh, for basically uh, the whole file system. 
and then track the group usage uh, in the projects directory and we'll basically follow up if uh, someone's over limit. Uh, and uh, the other thing to keep in mind is we are limiting the num, and this is true on Comet too. So uh, we are limiting uh, the inodes uh, to two million per user, and uh, uh, this this limit is basically in place because uh, if you're writing uh, millions of files, uh, Luster is probably not the right location for it, and you should look into changing the workflow to using the NVMe that's sitting on the files uh, on each node. Uh, and if your workflow does need intensive, uh, extensive small block IO or like lots of lots of small files, you should contact us if you need help with using the local scratch. Uh, I mean, this particular Luster file system uh, has metadata on MDT and can handle a lot more IOPS, so it's uh, it's a little more uh, better equipped to deal with the small file IO. But uh, we still recommend using NVMe wherever you can. So that brings me to the lo node local NVMe based uh, scratch file system. All the expands nodes have NVMe based local scratch storage. The disk sizes vary based on uh, the nodes. Uh, that's a typo there, okay. Uh, so the regular compute nodes have a one terabyte disk. Uh, it's about 900 gigs usable. The large memory nodes have 3.2 terabytes of local disk and about 2.9 terabytes usable. Uh, the GPU nodes have 1.6 terabytes of local storage, about 1.4 terabytes uh, usable. This is excellent for like IOPS intensive workloads. It's also pretty good in performance with large files too, uh, as long as they fit in the storage that is there. Uh, uh, so if you have uh, codes that generate a lot of files on a per task basis, uh, for example, OpenFORM used to do that, I think, the newer versions don't, but the older versions of OpenFORM would generate a like file per core per variable, I think. So for something like that, I would say uh, you should modify things so that you use the local storage and only store like large tar files in the Luster location. And uh, just like on Comet, uh, this uh, uh, directory gets created when your job starts. So it's in the prologue that a, a job specific directory gets created. So it's a slash scratch dollar user. A little different from comment, it's job underscore the slop, uh, job uh, job ID instead of uh, just the job ID on, uh, on comment. Key thing is this location is purged at the end of a job. So if you have any important data that has to be copied out uh, and Make sure if you're copying out and it's a million files, you're not copying out million files. You're tarring up that million files on the NVMe and moving the tar file to the Luster. Or you can tar directly into Luster, but don't try to move uh, a million files into Luster. <laughs> That's gonna probably not finish in the time that you have and will cause problems on the system side. So, uh, this is an example, basically it's a Gaussian application that uh, has a scratch directory setting. So you can see how we have used it. It's pretty simple. You just do, uh, you point uh, uh, your scratch directory to slash scratch dollar user job underscore, uh, job underscore slum underscore job ID. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is the slash temp is not that large on these nodes. so. You, if you are anticipating, uh, if you're using code that just uh, keys off the temp directory and writes to the temp directory, please set your temp dir, uh, tmp dir variable to uh, this location so that you pick up the NVMe scratch. So I think I'm about five minutes out, so let me summarize. So uh, basically we are using slum just like Comet uh, all the jobs have to go through the scheduler, don't run on the login nodes. Uh, we support both node exclusive and shared partition, just like Comet. So you have a few extra ones uh, to help you on the GPU side and also with the preempt options. Uh, the account information is required in job scripts. Uh, I want to add one more here. Uh, uh, you should uh, put in memory requirements uh, explicitly also. 
uh, and then we looked at the file system options. Uh, as I mentioned, we are going in production soon, so you will all get to get on and try this uh, once once the machine is available in production. Thanks. So let me stop and see if there were any uh, unanswered questions on on the. I think the Mahi, the last question from Don is uh, where where you can pick up. Uh, let's see. Can you say something about Dev Shem and the size and speed? Uh, let's see. Uh, well, the speed's going to be a lot faster because it's 3.2 gigahertz uh, memory. So DevSHM should do better, hopefully. There are more channels per node also. Like So uh, let's see. The Expanse uh, node uh, does about, Marty, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like 350 gigabytes per second, right? On the, uh, 325 gigabytes per second on the uh, memory bandwidth total on the node, I think compared to about, yeah, 100, about, about 110 on Comet. So there's a big, big increase. Now, if you're in a shared partition, you're sharing that with everybody. So uh, you could end up with a lower bandwidth per core. So you, uh, it really depends on what's going on if you're in a shared node. But on a regular compute node, if you take the whole node, yeah, you have a lot more memory bandwidth per core. In terms of size, well, it's a 256 gigabyte RAM, so uh, you will have to work with that constraint in, in addition to what your code needs. Let's see. Marty, was there anything else missing? Let's... I don't think so. I don't think I missed any other ones. Okay. So, uh, but yeah, and if if anyone has to, has, there's there's one from Kenneth. So, is there a way to signal to the job? I think maybe the question for Trevor. <laughs> I'll have to check on that. There should be. I'm assuming. Um, I mean, so I mean, I think I can. I mean, if maybe Trevor's muted, but so I mean, Kenneth, I think we um, we've discussed this uh, um, with with um, the systems group, and so it's it's possible. I think it's just a matter of how much time we can provide to co uh, allow the signaling to actually happen and for you to catch it. So it's sort of an open question, I think. So so this is Trevor. I, I don't see the question in the queue, but is the question about a signal for a preempting? Right. Yeah, ki kind yeah. of like so, uh, yeah. so there is the ability for the user to submit their job and ask for a specific signal to be sent um, when the job is going to be preempted. Um, but there are limits to how early that can happen before preempt time occurs because the preempt uh, grace time is only five minutes. So you can't ask for a 10 minute notification because we only know in Slurm that it's five minutes until preempt time. So, you know, you got to look at the, the, the settings on that and, and figure out whether or not you can basically do all your work that you need to do to, uh, to uh, checkpoint your job within the time limit that you have. You basically think of it as probably about three minutes of time limit from that signal until you could just have the node disappear under your feet. So yeah, um, but you can, you can definitely register your job when you submit it to receive a signal if it's going to be preempted. And that will come as soon as Slurm decides it wants that node. And then you'll get some sub subsequent signals again later on. But yeah, that that's totally, Google. That said, I don't think many people are using preempt right now and it probably aren't even using that feature because the users that are using preempt in early user don't really care if the node disappears. Um, they've got workflow managers that deal with all that kind of stuff, so. Hey folks, thanks Trevor, I'm gonna step in. We're starting our 10 minute break now, although people are free to keep chatting if they want and asking questions. And we'll come back at 12.25 where Marty Candace is going to talk about um, modules compiling and basic optimization for CPU and then GPU. So that will go until about 125. So we're on our break, but like I said, feel free to keep asking questions or answering them if you want to. Thanks. So uh, one quick addition to uh, answer Don, uh, Don's question about the mem uh, dev SHM. So apparently the 
the SHM is set to half of the total memory, so 128 gigs. Okay, thanks, Mahidar. I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording, and we'll take a 10-minute break, uh, stand up, get some, do some stretching, and we'll see you back again at about 12:25. I have a couple comments then. Okay, I've started the recording. Okay, everybody, welcome back. It's about 12:25, and we're going to go into our section on um, compiling and basic optimization in modules by Marty Candes. Uh, two comments. Um, uh, we typically post the chats, so uh, we'll have those online um, in a few um, days, along with an interactive, some interactive videos. And also the talks will be posted on the, a repository and I posted the link into the chat and we'll repost it um, at the end of the talks. With that, I'll uh, welcome Marty Candes and he can get started. All right, thanks, Mary. Um, let me go ahead and uh, share my screen. And let me talk. Uh, how do I go to full screen here? Forget. All right, one second here. Where is the view? Well, we can go ahead and get started. I'll, I'll figure this out in a second. Um, so thanks for uh, attending today. Um, I'm Marty Candice. I work with uh, under Mahi, uh, Mahidar in the, the user services group. And today wanted to go over what the uh, module environment on Expanse looks like and how it's different from Comet. Um, apologize in advance that I have not completely fleshed out the, the, all the material for the talk today. So I'll go over some of the material with regarding um, what, module, what the module environment does for you and how it's useful and sort of give you some best practices of how to use it. Um, because in my experience, some users are a little inexperienced with um, setting up their environment and it can kind of give them a bit of a headache. And so I kind of want to go over some uh, um, sort of basic material that you can, uh, you know, if you're not familiar with um, what the module environment's doing, you know, it'll give you some better context of, of, of why um, we're suggesting you uh, use it in a certain way and uh, how to go about compiling code and then also running code as well. So, um, uh, so I'll go over the, the, the module environment uh, uh, material and then sort of use the second half of the talk to um, do some interactive demos and show you how, you know, um, in real time, how you can, you know, take, say, um, some code that you've compiled on uh, Comet, if you have certain, you know, if you've, you've uh, documented sort of your build process there and how you can, you know, uh, modify it to then compile your code on, um, on Expanse and how um, the different sets of uh, software stacks that Mahi talked about um, are um, presented to you in the module environment itself. So let me close this chat so I can pay attention to the slides here. Um, so I want to start with some basic definitions, though, um, for, for people who, um, who, who might not be familiar. So um, when you log into Expanse or Comet, right, the, the program that's actually running when you log into your terminal is, is the shell program, right? And so this is the fundamental interface that you use to interact uh, with the system, right? So every time you log in, this, this, this shell program is running. And this is what you use to issue commands to, uh, to the system to uh, get your work done, right? And so um, the common ones, uh, common Linux shells are sort of listed here. Um, the, the, the default when you log into Expanse will be um, your bash shell. And this is what's used um, uh, by, I would say, majority of uh, users on the system. However, if you do have a preference on what your default shell uh, would be, um, then you need to contact us um, via the paving system with a change request. Essentially, this default needs to be set on the, the system side for, for, for each user. Okay. Um, so when you log in and your shell starts up, you have a bunch of built-in commands that you're probably familiar with, right? So you have sort of 
you know, the CD command to change directories, the make directory uh, to create directories, you know, the list command, the ls command to list the files and directories in your home directory or whatever directory that you're working in, right? So this is probably pretty basic stuff that everybody's familiar with, but you know, there, there is a point that I'll, I'll get to here in a second. Um, and when you are working on expanse or comet, you know, many people often have multiple um, terminal windows open up. And these are both, for example, I'm running two different terminal windows here on my local desktop in this image, where the, these are these different um, shell sessions are individual instances of the shell program running that has you know, its own, each, each one has its own state and environment that is set, right? So these, although these two windows look um, uh, completely the same, right? There might be differences between the two shell environments, depending on what commands you've issued in them, right? Um, now, there are, um, in, 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 when you're working with the shell, you can also set variables in, in in, in with with the shell and so basically a shell variable is just a string that you can attach a value to and they can have different types you know i'll show some examples during the compilation of using shell and shell and environment variables um, when um, compiling code um, but most importantly um, one of the things uh, that's uh, a shell variable is only sort of bound to that shell session so if you have for example in the last image two separate um, shell windows open and you've defined a variable in one and not in the other while you're sort of maybe doing some deep interactive debugging or compiling your code, um, those environments might be different. So the, the, the shell variables are only local to a specific instance of your, your shell that's running. Right? And so, for example, one of the things that shell environments are usually used for is for, you know, very temporary data that might change pretty quickly. And so, one example of this is the, the present working directory environment variable. Um, and so, for example, I'm showing here a bit of code at the bottom where I'm just, you know, echo, I'm, I'm logged into Expanse, I'm echoing the, uh, the, the present working directory. And when you log in, your default directory is your home directory on the system. But for example, if I then change to the Expanse Lester Scratch um, uh, directory for my, my username, then the present working directory changes to that, right? These, these variables are used to, you know, track the changes that are going on of where you are in, on the system. And so the, the, the shell knows, um, you know, when you run an LS command, you know, what directory you want to run the LS command on, right? So this is pretty basic stuff, but, you know, just to give you some context that um, this is what uh, some of these definitions that you should be aware of. Now, Environment variables are sort of the, the key to what the, the module environment is going to be controlling for you. And environmental environment variables are just shell variables that are sort of exported to what we call the shell's environment. And this allows other processes or commands that you are um, running through the shell program to uh, see these environment variables. So unlike just straight shell variables, um, the shell variables are only visible to the shell program itself. Environment variables are then visible to the other, you know, applications, binaries, uh, other commands that you might be running from the shell too, right? And so, effectively, also one of the main uses is the environment variables are used to sort of configure how your shell responds to the commands that you issue. And, um, you know, the, I would say in general, environment variables are unlike, you know, regular shell variables, environment variables are used to store more persistent data that isn't going to change much during your shell session. Okay, so for example, I'm giving the quick example here at the bottom of your, your home directory, right? No matter where you are on the system or whatever program you're running, um, you're probably going to want to know where your home directory is on the system. So this is sort of a, a static environment variable that really shouldn't change ever uh, for you, right? Now, the, when the shell starts up there and you log into the system, when you log in the system, the shell undergoes this uh, sort of initialization phase on, on startup, right? And it's usually a, a multi-step process that actually there's some configuration files that some of you are probably familiar with that are, are, are looked at by the shell and used to configure your environment, 
at, at startup. Right. So there's going to be a default set of environment variables and shell variables that are in your uh, in your shells environment when you start up. And I won't probably go through all of the different initialization files that you can use, but I'll cover kind of the, the high level ones that we um, are most commonly used by, by people. So there's, I think I have a list of seven in, in the next two slides, but there are system wide um, shell initialization files, and these are the ones in the, the Etsy directory, so Etsy profile and Etsy bash RC. So these are launched basically by um, by the, the operating or the, the shell looks for these um, configuration files first. These are sort of system wide settings that um, we control for you, and you know may put things in there from time to time to simplify sort of your default environment on on the system. Now you can also um, uh, control what your particular shell environment looks like by um, modifying some of these other configuration files or creating these configuration files in your home directory on the system. So the two most common ones that people would modify is either the dot dash profile, if you're, these are obviously for, for the bash shell, they're, they're, the names are different for different shells, but the, the dot bash profile is one. And the dot bash RC is probably the most common one that I think I see um, users use on comets and, and, and systems in general. So the, the thing about the, the different, the, the reason there's so many different configuration files is there are different types of shells when, you, um, uh, when you're running on a system essentially, right? So this bash RC, you can see the description here is executed when they, non-interactive bash shell starts. And so, for example, when running a batch job script on Expanse. So this is why this one's pretty important. So if you modify your bash RC file to change sort of the configuration of your, your shell's environment, this is always going to be run for any batch job that you run on Expanse. And so this is why I kind of wanted to go over um, this sort of set of uh, definitions and provide the context is if you try to modify your module, try to uh, modify your, your environment uh, through these configuration files, you have to be aware of when they're going to be executed. We see a lot of times people modifying their bash RC file and getting into trouble when, for example, they take, you know, they're doing one type of workflow for a certain set of calculations or simulations, and then they switch to a different code, the different application for a completely different set of work, maybe some post-processing step, but they haven't changed how their bash RC was set up for the, the first workflow for how it needs to change for the second workflow. Okay. And so um, even though I'm going over uh, this, this material, the, the, the key takeaway is really, um, to not use these configuration files. This is what the module environment on um, HPC systems is for. It's going to allow you to easily modify your shell environment on the fly for each individual job that you, job type you might want to run on the system. Okay, um, and this is sort of a little bit more uh, information. I didn't quite change the, the title of these slides, but this is, as I mentioned, there's different types of shells and when the different configuration files are executed depend upon whether it's a non-login or login shell or an interactive versus non-interactive shell. Um, and so I'll clean up these notes for, for you online, but I don't think we necessarily need to go into it unless there's questions. Um, but the, the key one is for um, when you're running a batch job script or a, bat, a batch or a shell script in general is a shell script is always running in a non-interactive shell, right? And that's why this you know, modifications to your bash RC will affect any script that you run on the system, right? And that's why the key takeaway is, is if you aren't, if you're going to run multiple applications with different that require different environments on the system, you really don't want to modify your bash RC. Otherwise, you're going to have to change it for every single job that you need to slightly change the software environment around it. Right. And so that's sort of my uh, um, overall uh, uh, I guess, uh, perspective on the, the issues I see with with users using their bash RC. 
Now, the module environment um, you'll see is mostly modifying both environment variables that are required for a certain piece of software. Um, but the two most important things that it's modifying is your path environment variable. So if you're not familiar with the path environment variable, right, this is what is allowing when you run a command in, in your shell, in your terminal, right, the, the operating system needs to know where to look for that command. So if you've compiled your application and you have the binary sitting in some directory in your home directory, if you haven't told the shell um, program about where to look for that binary, it won't be found. You can't just run the command and expect the operating system to know where the binary is, right? And this is the same issue with any command that you're gonna run from the shell, right? And so the, the module environment, one of the, the main, its main purposes is to control these path changes for you so that when you load a module, it tells the shell where to look for the application and all of the dependencies that are required to be available in the path for you. And this is probably the second most uh, uh, modified uh, variable that you'll see that the module environment is doing for you. So the, the LD library path, if you're not familiar, is basically where the, um, the shell is gonna look for when you have to, when you go to run an application, if it's compiled against say shared libraries, Again, just like, it need, just like the operating system needs to know where to look for the, the binaries, it needs to also look for the libraries that it, it's going to call out to, right? And so it's, again, this is what the module environment is actually doing for you under the hood. It's trying to um, simplify all of these path changes um, to set up the shell environment to, uh, uh, you know, as, as easily as possible to um, get you, you know, a, a simplified user interface to running the applications that you want. Right? Now, on Comet, what we used was the uh, environment module system. So this module system is you know, one of the module systems that are out there that allow you to set up a nice command line driven interface to make all of these changes to your shell's environment, right? And it's particularly you'll see, I mean, many people who are familiar with running HPC systems or running on multiple HPC systems, you've probably used environment modules before if you've run on Comet. This is the environment module system that uh, we've, we've been using there. And it's, it's a little bit of an older version uh, of what's been used before. Um, but if you're curious about you know, the details, right, there's the link to the, to the URL uh, for, the, for the project. Um, and so the module um, environment allow it gives you the, the module system essentially gives you a, a set of command line tools to um, you know navigate the software that's been installed on the system and is manageable by the module system itself and so these are the module commands that if you've used the module uh, systems before you're familiar with these are probably the ones that i use the most that i just listed so module list allows you to look at what modules are available or uh, what modules are currently loaded on the system. Module avail um, for can be run with or without this package uh, input to look for what's available on the system. Module purge allows you to sort of clear any modules that you've loaded. Um, and again, uh, which is the next commands if you wanna actually put a specific package into your uh, into your shell environment. You do a module load. If you want to take it out, you do a module unload. And then a module show is basically to get more information about the package itself. For example, I'll show you that the, it, uh, you know, it tells you more information about how the uh, how that application may have been compiled. For example, um, so I have examples in here. Any other kind of not useful? I might switch over to doing some interactive work before I get to the, the new module environment system. But let me go ahead and boot up a uh, terminal here and log into Expanse. So um, let's just go over the, the module commands uh, on Expanse, um, at least the, the ones that are going to be exactly the same as you ran on Comet. So for example, my first one in the list was a module list. Let me do this. Right. 
And so when I log into Comet, or sorry, when I log into Expanse, you see here that there is, like on Comet, there is a default set of uh, modules that are loaded for you. And so it's this shared module, this CPU uh, 1.0 module, and this default modules uh, module there. The only one you really need, um, you know, is the CPU one, which we'll talk about in a second. But let me just go through um, the other commands. So the, I think the next one in my list was, let me just double check here. Oh, yeah, module avail. So for example, if you want to um, know what uh, compilers are available on the system. For example, if you're interested in the GCC compiler, you can just run a module avail GCC and it'll give you a list of all of the GCC compilers or perhaps if GCC here in this example is, is shown in the name of the, the module name, it'll also appear here. So you can see here we have four different versions of GCC shown here. Um, and two are actually the same version, and I'll explain that um, in, in a bit here. But then you can see if you just have GCC in the name that you're searching for, it'll also show um, other uh, packages that might be um, there with GCC in the name. So for example, this looks like we have a NetCDF and an OpenMP library that were compiled with GCC on, on the system. Okay, the next one was probably module purge on my list, Oops. right? So if I have some default modules loaded, the module purge command will unload all of the modules that have been loaded for you, right? Oops. So now I have a clean environment that has none of the other uh, environment variables that may have been set by those other modules uh, in the shell session, right? And so let's let's go through a quick exercise and, and show you how the module environment is is how the how the, how the module system is actually making changes to some of those environment variables that, that I mentioned, like path and lb path, right? And so if I do an echo, I can see my path and my lb library path, right, which has nothing right now. And so if I want to um, say compile a code for, uh, for the, say the AMD compute nodes, what we've set up in the module environment is uh, uh, maybe, let's do maybe a module show while we're here. I don't know if Trevor's actually put a description on here, maybe, but yeah, he has. So it looks like this module CPU uh, 1.0 is basically to load the software that has been compiled for the AMD compute nodes on Expanse explicitly. So this is kind of your meta, meta module that you'll load to get access to all of the compilers, MPIs, math libraries that you should use for Expanse's AMD compute nodes. So let's go ahead and do that. So we'll go ahead and load CPU.1. And if you do a module avail, you can then see um, what packages are available. And so I think as Mahidar mentioned in his, his last talk, we're using SPAC to um, build and deploy all of the um, uh, packages on Comet for uh, for users. And so this is probably a good point to explain what's going on here if with all of the modules that you can kind of see on my screen now. So the module load CPU 1.0 uh, loaded all of the packages that were shown here in this CM shared apps spec CPU LMOD um, core, uh, core set of packages. Okay, and you can see below it though, there's also a bunch of other modules where the CPU 1.0 module lives actually. And these other modules are essentially right now in, visible to you um, 
these are sort of standard modules that come with the uh, system uh, manager that we're using to sort of deploy all the system software. So we're actually, I think we're going to try to clean this up a bit because essentially you don't need to look at these CM local, CM shared uh, modules here um, that are sort of extraneous and should, for the most part, for example, this is where when I did the module load GCC or module uh, avail GCC, we saw two versions of the GCC 9.2.0 compiler. So one was coming from the SPAC installed version, which you should use if you want to use GCC 9.2.0. Uh, but there's also another GCC 9.2 here in the CM local that um, you could use, um, but this is really uh, for the um, system administrators at this point right now. And so hopefully we'll get this um, cleaned up so there's not too much confusion. Um, however, I will mention that there are some modules that you um, will want to uh, potentially use in the say CM local um, uh, and in the CM shared uh, module environments. There is obviously the CPU.1.0 and the GPU.1.0, uh, which are these, these meta module files that we've created. You'll also, if you're using Singularity, Singularity is visible here in the, over in the CM local uh, module environment. There's also in the user share we have, if you're using Globus, this is one that will likely um, stay in, in sort of the visible um, uh, module shown to you. And then also, if you've uh, looked at the Expanse, uh, um, if, if the Expanse uh, user guide, there's also uh, the, the if, you, if you wanna check your accounting and allocations, the SDSC.10 uh, module file here will load sort of this Expanse client uh, package that you can use to check your um, allocation usage, essentially. Right? So uh, personally, I think it's still a little confusing for, for some people, um, uh, but this is uh, sort of, if you're gonna getting on, if you're on the system now or on the system soon, you might still see um, some of these other modules and just want to you know indicate not to get confused if you're if you're trying to compile your you know application for either the AMD compute nodes or the the Intel based Nvidia uh, GPU nodes um, you know the two packages that you really want to focus on first loading is either the CPU 1.0 and then the GPU 1.0 right. okay so you can see here that we have the um, CPU 1.0 uh, module loaded. Now, if you want, I think as I mentioned to Ron in the, um, the chat earlier, if you want to compile for the AMD compute nodes, the GCC 10.2.0 is the compiler that you'll want to use. This is the one that will have the uh, Zen 2 optimizations available. And I assume if you use, say, as Ron was asking about the dash um, uh, mArch equals native, it should hopefully pick that up that these are AMD compute nodes and use uh, Zen 2 nodes and use that as the uh, architecture to compile against. Right? So just kind of clean this up. Right. So as I said, right, right now we have just the CPU uh, 1.0 module loaded. And what we're going to do now is module load GCC.10.2.0. And hopefully we'll see the path changes that have been made. And you can see now, you know, prior to loading the GCC 10.2 module, the path and LB library path were different. And now if you want to just say run GCC, Right, it's that version of GCC is the first GCC found in your path, and that's the one that is available in your shell session to um, compile code. For example, if I do a module purge and then figure out which GCC, right, you'll see that you get the system um, GCC. So GCC 831 is the default GCC for basically Red uh, CentOS, CentOS 8. Right, and so this is um, this is why the module environment exists to help you make changes to the path that you need to get access to the different versions of software. Okay, and so that is um, 
you know, that's, that's what the module environment is doing for you. And this is why um, if you have different applications um, and, and, and you're going to compile them in different ways and then run them, you, you really don't want to put the modules load commands in your, in your bash RC file. You really want to put those commands in either say a build script, which we'll look at uh, shortly that you want to use to compile the code or when you go run the code, right? The, those module loads have to be the same. So you actually want to just load the modules in your batch job script itself, right? Otherwise you're going to probably run into some headaches if you, you know, forget to change your batch RC before you run a certain, uh, a certain, uh, a certain a certain application, right? If you're switching from one workflow to the other, right? Okay, so maybe I'll stop here for a second and ask if there's any questions about um, anything that I haven't covered in the module environment. I, I think I, I just remembered one point that I definitely wanted to make, um, um, but maybe I'll stop here for for any, if there's any questions. I don't know. Okay, I guess. So I don't, I don't see the chat. So yeah. So Marty, there's been a lot of questions, and Trevor and okay. Mahi are doing a great job answering them. I don't think they've been stumped, so it's quite active. <laughs> okay. Okay. Great good, job. Good. 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 Okay. Um, okay. So we've, we've sort of covered these basic um, module commands that you're probably familiar with on um, comments. Um, so I want to just highlight before we switch over to actually, um, you know, showing some examples of building code on Expanse and interacting with the module environment to do that and, and the changes that I, I would have to make to other package, you know, other pieces of software that I've compiled before. Um, the, the last, the, the key thing that we need to point out is um, the, the, the module environment, or the module system used on Expanse is different from Comet. Right. So on Comet, we use the environment module system that I um, had a slide on before briefly, which is, you know, one version of a module system that, you know, you can use to manage um, all of these path changes and access to you know, the software on an HPC system. Um, LMOD is, is a newer um, system that was developed at TAC, actually. So um, and one of the things it does nicely is it tries to help um, the users avoid mistakes that could be made with the environment module system that was available on Comet. And in particular, the way they do this is through a hierarchical um, module system, essentially, right? Where essentially, if you want to compile a code with GCC 10.2, like we just showed, um, and it's an MPI code, you need to then load an MPI module. However, on Comet, um, you know, you could load a compiler uh, module, one version of a compiler module and an MPI module that weren't compatible necessarily, right? So usually what we do on these HPC systems is we cross compile, you know, I mean, we, we, we compile multiple versions of the MPI for a particular compiler, right? So if you really do want to have access to OpenMP, Intel MPI and MVAPage 2, you, you really have to compile a version of each of those for each compiler that's available on the system, right? Um, but the one problem with the modules environment, if you didn't have all that, um, all of those different versions available for a particular compiler that you wanted to use, you could get caught up by loading the compiler module that did not have a compatible version of, uh, say that version of MPI that you wanted to use, right? And you'd probably send us tickets, like why can't I get this to the compiler? Why isn't this running? Um, also, for example, one of the common problems we would see is um, users would load multiple versions of MPI in their, in their, in their, um, in the, say in their batch RC or actually in their, their batch job scripts. And that would then confuse, you know, your application of which MPI to use. And so, LMOD um, allows, uh, uh, um, you know, uses this hierarchical um, system to avoid these types of problems where you can only load the types of MPI that are available for that particular compiler, 
right? And so this is kind of what's what's nice uh, about Elmod is it helps avoid these types of problems that you, you might have run into in the past on Comet. Um, now, uh, the the one I would say, um, you know, uh, the one thing that you know is going to be less familiar to you is, is is how that happens, like in practice, maybe. I think a lot of people have probably used LMOD on different systems, so they, they, they are probably familiar with it. But um, I'll just go ahead and show you what this sort of means in practice. Open up my terminal again. Okay. So let's go ahead and clear. And so what do I have loaded? I have no modules loaded in this shell. So let's go ahead and load. Let me go ahead and do this, right? So if we do a module, so if we if we start with a clear um, module environment, right? And you do a module avail, right? You'll see that there is no SPAC modules anymore. It's just those default modules from the cluster management software that I mentioned before, right? And so that's why these sort of meta packages exist in the, in, in, in the management modules, essentially, right? So if you load CP1, that's, uh, that's what gives you access to the SPAC-based installed modules, essentially, right? And so let's go ahead and load. Um, so we see the, the meta packages load the, the correct SPAC environment that you want for either the CPU or GPU nodes, depending on what you want to do. And then let's say we want to build a, uh, an application with GCC 10.2. So if we do a module load GCC 10.2 and do a module avail, you'll then see that there is another sort of sub module environment here that was created with all these packages. That these packages were built with GCC 10.2, right? And so if you, um, you know, as you can see, we have, you know, a fair amount already of different applications uh, in here, because this, as I mentioned, GCC 10.2 is the one that has the Zen 2 optimizations that you can take advantage of. But again, we also have multiple versions of MPI, like I mentioned. But what's nice, like I said, about the, the LMOD system is you're only presented here the, the certain types of MPIs or math libraries that are um, associated with and compatible uh, with GCC 10.2, right? And so let's go ahead and say my, I'm, I'm, this is an application, say it's an MPI application that I wanna build. And I wanna use, let's say, open MPI, right? And do a module avail. And then there is another sort of nested uh, environment shown here. Once you load the a certain version of MPI, you'll then discover that there are already certain applications that were built here with both GCC 10.2 and this version of OpenMPI, right? And so as you progressively load, say, your compiler and then your MPI, you'll be revealed more and more applications that are available to you from that combination of compiler and MPI. So for example, if your code required FFTW, right? This one is presumably compiled for um, in you know, using the, the parallel options to use MPI, and it's being it's it's compatible with the GCC 10.2 and OpenMPI Open MPI 404. Right now, one of the questions you'll probably um, uh, have if you're not familiar with LMOD is. Okay, yeah, this is great. I can sort of it sort of helps keep the module environment a little bit more organized and prevents um, sort of conflicting modules from being loaded at the same time. But how am I supposed to know that that version of FFTW is available with you know GCC 10.2, OpenMPI 404? Like, is it a bit, like for example, your question might be, is it available for MVAPH2 yet? Like, how, how do I know? And so the one one of the new commands that you'll probably get familiar with is um, module spider. And so this is one of um, uh, the, the new module commands that isn't available in the old environment module system. This is allows you to search essentially this hierarchical structure for the packages you need to load to get to the packages you want. 
So let's go ahead and run that example that I just mentioned of FFTW, right? Like if I wanted to use a different version of MPI or um, compilers, um, you know, what, what FFTWs have been compiled and are available for the different combinations that I might want to use, right? And so if I clear this and do a module spider FFTW, you'll see a list of the different modules that are available, um, FFTW modules that are available, and what modules you have to successively load to get to it, right? And so you can see here, if in on the AMD compute nodes, we have um, an FFTW, a serialized version, I'm guessing that's what this is, compiled with only GCC 10.2. We also have parallel versions compiled with both mbapich2 and OpenMPI, right? And so that's how this, this is the one new command that you need to really get familiar with if you're sort of confused about like, okay, what software is available? Um, because it's gonna, I mean, you don't wanna just start loading random compilers and, my, and MPIs to figure out which, you know, what sort of mass libraries or other dependencies you might need to build your software, right? And so this module spider command really simplifies the process of figuring out you know, it figures out for you, it's like, all right, what's available and what's already been compiled and like what combinations of other modules are needed to be loaded to use it, right? Um, okay, so I think, yeah, I think that's the only really new command I wanted to cover in, um, in, in LMOD because it's gonna be the, the one that you'll get the most bang for your buck uh, right off the bat. Okay, so I'll stop here for a second and if there's any questions, let me know. I will sort of get set up here for doing some comp compilation examples. So I don't know if anybody, if there's anything in the chat. So Marty, um, yes. just about now, uh, you should be looking at GPU, so when you're ready to move to GPU, I don't know how yeah. much you've allocated for each one, just. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really stick to the original plan of doing okay. two separate ones. I wanted to really cover the module environment in general, and then I can show, I'll show both. Um, maybe I'll start with a GPU example. Um, uh, or, yeah. Uh, it's up to you. I'm just letting yeah. you. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. So, um, Okay, so now, now that you're sort of familiar with the module environment and some of the differences that are uh, on Expanse versus Comet, one of the things you might want to do is, you know, take um, some code that you've had on Comet, you know, built on Comet, and then transfer it over to um, Expanse. Now, um, I'm going to you know, pick some examples that I have from Comet right now and, and show you how I modify or you know, both show you how I compile code in, in general and how um, you might want to think about doing something similar um, for sort of reproducibility aspects in the future, but also just you know how to then use the module uh, environment that we just uh, explored and to compile um, code on Expanse. So the first thing I want to say, and I think Mahi uh, mentioned during his talk is we, we in, uh, unlike on Comet, where we sort of didn't um, didn't uh, monitor this as much as maybe the system administrators would have liked us to, and, um, and we really do encourage you to compile code on the type of compute node that you're um, running on, um, especially if you're going to be using GPU code. Right, um, the login nodes are AMD. Um, uh, they're they're very similar to the, um, the, the actual compute nodes out on the system. Um, but even for uh, CPU code, we, we do encourage you to say, if you want to do some sort of interactive compilation to you know, you know, you know, figure out how to build the piece of software that you want to, uh, you know, to, to, to grab an interactive session and, and do that and sort of develop that build process. And in it, and and in particular on the GPU sides, you really should do that um, because again, as you know, it, depending on the, how you sort of structured your, your build process, right? If you're using say the, the MArch native kind of settings, right? You need the compiler to pick up um, on those optimizations and you need to um, uh, sort of, you know, if you want it to be you know, simpler, you need to really be on the type of architecture that you're trying to compile against. 
you can cross compile, but for we've run into problems ourselves with that a bit. So this is why we're really encouraging you to you know compile on the node type you want, and you know try not to do it in the login nodes because sometimes compilation processes can be a bit involved and computationally intensive, and that would affect other users on the login nodes. Okay, so let's go ahead and grab an interactive session. Uh, I have, I think I'll do uh, the GPU. I'll do a GPU example. Let me just grab the commands. Uh, And uh, I guess I'll do, uh, let's see, 16 gigabytes, one GPU. And I'm sure I have less than 30 minutes, so I'll just do this. Oops. Ah, so this is, again, Slurm is not loaded in your default uh, environment, so. Mm -hmm. okay. So I basically started an interactive session on one of Expanse's uh, GPU nodes. And now uh, I didn't uh, set this up real quick. Okay, sorry, I need to correct uh, this real quick. Uh, sorry, I need to. Uh, Log in with my credentials correctly. So I can pull some files from uh, comments. Okay, so we're on an interactive compute node and I want to pull some files um, from Comet. Oh, this is not working right now. No, it's probably not. Sorry. Let me just do it here first. Okay. So I'm going to install some software in my software uh, directory here. So I have some software sitting on comets. Uh, and some build scripts that I've used in the past. Okay, so I'm gonna grab these. Um, I'm gonna get this build script. Okay. So Gromax is a molecular dynamics code that's widely used on Comet. And so from time to time, we've had to sort of build multiple versions for people when we don't really have those in the standard module environment. Um, so I have this build script that I've created to compile Gromax with um, MPI, OpenMP, and CUDA itself. And so this will be a good example because there is a slight difference with um, uh, the CUDA. Okay. So let me go open up this build script. So this is what I do when I'm compiling code. So you might be working interactively for a while to figure out how to build the software, but eventually once you sort of have um, the set of modules that you're using for your application and uh, the different dependencies that are needed and how you sort of configure that, what I do is I create a build script essentially that sort of codifies all the changes that I made to the environment itself to compile the code. And the reason I do this is because usually I'm handing these um, build scripts to users so they compile, say, compile this version of the code in their home directory. But as I mentioned, you also have to load those same modules when you run the code, right? And so by having a build script like this, which could also be run as a batch job, you can see here I have it. So I can compile the code in batch form as well. I don't have to do it interactively. I can just launch it and you know forget about it and let it compile and then come back later. Um, 
but it really codifies what was done to compile the code because you need to know exactly what modules were loaded um, when you compiled the code to then run it, right? And so this is where uh, another common problem that users get tripped up on. They forget how they compiled the code and then we have to sort out what modules there need to be loaded when they try to run it, right? And so that's why, you know, trying to codify things in a build script like this is, is I think, a, a good practice. And it helps us when you run into problems so we can actually see, you know, oh, this is what I did and this is where it's failing. Can you help me figure out why this part of the build is failing? So this gives us a, a more complete view of what you were actually doing. Okay. so. Um, let me try to reduce the uh, text here a bit uh, of this build script. What what time does this session go to, Mary? Can you just remind me? I think it's is it twenty five. Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. So I'm just going to log into Expanse here. And just so we can have another screen here for the uh, what modules I might want to load, right? So again, by default, when you log in, right, the, the CPU stack is visible to you, right? And so what you'll want to do if you're compiling on GPU is do a module purge and then module load GCC8, oh, uh, module, I'm sorry, GPU, I'm getting ahead of myself. Right, you can see that the path and the, the module environment for SPAC is different than the one on the AMD compute nodes, which makes sense because this is uh, these are Intel based CPUs and NVIDIA GPUs. And um, you'll also notice there isn't, for example, a default GCC and the module that's loaded in, in the SPAC environment up here. And the reason for this is we're actually using the system GCC GCC 831, right? That's already in your path for most of the builds that we're doing um, on the Intel compute nodes. Um, so, uh, and so that's what I'm gonna use right now. And so in, in, in this case, I don't really have a module, um, uh, a module that I'm loading uh, for the compiler itself. Um, because basically all of the defaults here um, are being built with this GCC 831 uh, uh, that's available. So for example, this open MPI 404 is being built with GCC 831. So this is one caveat to the, um, to the module environment on the GPU side. Like you have to sort of keep in your head that these packages in the spec environment were built with um, GCC 831. So if you want to use this MPI, open MPI 404, you're going to, um, you know, you're, you're, by default, you're using the, the, the GCC 831. So I'm going to change my um, build script here to use that open MPI 404. And let's just double check to make sure that if I do a module load, there's also a CMake in there. Probably doesn't matter. Well, there's a CMake here. It's already there. So I'm going to change my CMake module here to the 8.3 or 8.3.18.2. And then um, this is where the caveat comes in with the, the module environment on the one of the caveats on the, the GPU side uh, come in. So right now, at least, the CUDA um, modules that are available are actually in the system managed module environment. And so if we look at this, um, you'll see the CUDA 10.2 is available down here in these CM shared modules, right? And so the, the default one to load, I believe is just the, the toolkit. And I, haven't, I don't think I've run into any problems with having to actually load the rest of them, but you might run into issues like that. And if you do, let us know. Um, but I believe everything that I've done testing wise, if I just use the, 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 the main toolkit one, um, it works. So 
but that's obviously dependent on the codes and, and that you might be compiling against. I mean, basically, again, remember the modules are just telling the, the shell to really know where to look for certain things. So if all the paths that are in the toolkit module are there and really point to most of the uh, libraries in, in CUDA that you're compiling against, it's, it's probably fine. But you, you might run into some edge cases that we haven't uh, come up with yet. And in this case, maybe um, I'll change this. I know the Gromax is a new version here. And essentially, this is what my build scripts look like. I sort of declare some environment variables that set what modules I want so I can use them later to describe where to install things and create paths and things like that. And essentially, right, there's no one caveat here is there isn't really a compiler module. It'll just be GCC by default. But you know, you then, you know, I always do a module purge before compiling. And then I load the modules that are needed to create the environment that I want to then compile the program, right? And then I do here, I'm just downloading the source code, creating some directories and then running CMake, which is the, 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 build, um, you know, the build program used for, for Gromax here. And you know, there's different settings that you can set for your, obviously for your code. And um, these are sort of just default ones that are used on Comet forever. And so all I've really done is change the modules that have been loaded, right? And then I can either run this interactively and start compiling the code. Um, there was an error here, what was that? Marty, oh, you, I, you're missing I the forgot. GPU. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, I actually did this earlier when I was uh, uh, testing the examples. Um, so yeah, I did it again, okay. So there, there, the one other module that I need to add which Mahi uh, just pointed out is, is uh, expanse GPU module, right? Right, because basically when I do the module purge, um, I've you know removed the GPU stack from my environment, right? And so if I do a module load, that should then load all of the packages that I'm expecting to see, and then I can load those subsequently. Right? So yeah, so that's what we usually do when we're trying to help you compile software is we construct these build scripts that, you know, sort of, you know, cement in what was done. And so I definitely recommend trying to do that. I mean, obviously, sometimes you want to do this interactively and just get a sense of like, oh, is this going to work? Is this going to work? Which is fine. But I, as you work through it, I would definitely recommend, you know, having another terminal open with, you know, creating that build script on the fly. Because for example, in, in this case, I was very easily able to switch over to Gromax, say 20 uh, from 19, what did I have, dot four, dot three to 20.4 and basically changed nothing other than a few variables that were in the script, right? I just changed the variables that were pointing to different uh, module names and the version of the package itself, right? And so not every, not every code is set up, you know, to do that that easily, but it's, it's, it's a good practice that I would encourage um, folks, to, folks to take a look at. And in particular, as I set up the code, I'll just stop the compilation now. Um, you know, you can also set these up as batch job scripts because there, for example, there wasn't uh, someone who asked, well, if I'm, I'm doing this in debug and it's going to take longer to compile um, my package, how, how, how should I do that? You could either wait for an interactive node on one of the regular compute nodes or the regular GPU nodes, or you could also, you know, if you have a build script like this, you could just submit it as a job. Like once you know that the build is looking like it's going to work, um, you can, uh, you know, submit it as a job to the scheduler itself. And one thing that's nice about that when I'm compiling software is that, um, you know, you get a build out. I mean, you have the complete output file from the build itself. So if, even if the build fails, you know where it fails and you can look up the entire history of the build to see what was happening. Right. And so if you want, I mean, so, I mean, this is, you know, this is what we do when we're um, compiling code and it's really helpful for debugging purposes. And it's another reason that um, you know, I definitely would encourage you to think about you know, building code this way. And especially since we're sort of you know, asking people to try to build out on the cluster itself, not on the login nodes, this is one other way to, another way to do that. Um, 
and I think that's about out of time. And if there's any questions, I guess we should take them now. And I think there's probably a break, so I can stick around during the break if people have questions. Hey, Marty, um, I got yes. pulled away for a couple minutes in the middle. I don't know if you already mentioned this, but do you have examples of these uh, Slurm batch uh, compiler build scripts in the examples area for people to kind of take what you've shown very quickly here and implement it themselves? Yeah, no, that's a that's a good that's a good um, that's a good question. Uh, no, we do not. I, I do not have them. On. I can put them on today. But yeah, we do have some of these sitting on comment. But yeah, they're hard to find. Essentially, this is um, yeah. Maybe we should keep. Uh, yeah, yeah. Basically, yeah, we'll we'll put these somewhere. Uh, some of these examples in 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 on expanse in the examples directories that we have. Um, I don't know if anyone from our team has put in the examples on there yet, but I think by the time we get in production, we'll definitely have some examples there. So, and if you're currently on the system in terms of early user program, you know, if you, if you want um, uh, access to some of these examples, I can, you know, ping us with a ticket and I can show you where they are on Comet and you can sort of play around with them. Or, you know, copy, copy one over essentially. Okay, well, um, if there's no more questions, thanks, Marty. We'll come back at um, 1.35 where Nicole Walter will talk about job charging, followed by Suba, she'll um, go over the Expanse portal and then we'll do interactive computing. And uh, we'll see you guys in about 10 minutes, 1.35. Going so we stay on time. We we have Nicole Walter who will be talking about job charging, uh, followed by Suba who will talk about the OOD portal, and then I'll talk about interactive computing. Uh, this will run till two fifteen, and then we'll have a final session on data management. Okay, thanks. All right. So can everyone see my screen or so yep, I assume you can all see my screen. So um, I'm going to talk about Expanse managing allocations and charging. And we've touched on this a little bit in the previous presentations and there were a lot of discussion. There was a lot of discussion in the chat about this. So for the most, so some of this might be repetitive, but there are some, some little tidbits in here that are going to be different for Comet and that we haven't touched on yet. So I hope it's helpful. Um, and one of, one of the goals that we can get out of this, this presentation is that based on how we charge and knowing, understanding how we charge, you can better pre prepare your, um, your proposals because you know, you know how the resources are going to be used and how you can use them. And it'll also help you when you're, you're thinking about how to set up your workflows. So I'm gonna start with the upbeat that job charging is super simple, um, at least on, on the user's behalf. You can talk to our system support staff and they'll say they work very hard to make sure that it's super simple for you all. Um, so on the top level, as Mahi mentioned before, Expanse and Expanse GPU are completely separate resources and at SDSC and Expanse for, for, I mean, at Exceed for that matter, all resources are allocated in what we call service units or SUs. But just because they're, they're called the same thing does not mean that they are the same at all. So as before with the Expanse and Expanse GPU, an Expanse unit is um, allocated in core hour where a GPU, Expanse GPU SU is going to be a GPU hour or a GPU hour. Um, in addition, you need to know that even if they are both allocated as core hours where Expanse and Comet were both allocated as core hours, the Expanse core hour is not equivalent to the compute or the, the Comet compute hour or core hour. Sorry about that. Um, some of the things that Another thing that we need to take in consideration is when you request a job, 
you're not just requesting the core hour, but the core hour is uh, represents a core hour. So with the core hour, you are also considering the what else comes with that. So that'll include the memory or for GPUs, it'll represent the cores and the memory involved. Um, kind of the high level thought here is that jobs charged Jobs are charged for the resources that you request. And when I say resources you request, I mean the, the actual cores or GPUs you request. At, and that'll be in separate from, I'm sorry, the jobs charged are for the resources you request, not the resources that you use. So if you request five cores and you run it for an hour, but you, own, you run a serial job, you're gonna get charged for all five cores regardless. Another important thing to note is that the minimum charge for all jobs is one SU. So if you run a on one core for a couple of seconds, it's gonna get charged one SU. But if you run on one core for an entire hour, that will also get charged one SU. So when you're thinking about your workflows here, it's, it's something that you should consider into bundling lots of small jobs together in one job. So on the high level, the, the charging algorithm is gonna be the resources you request, so either GPUs or core hours, times the job duration. The job duration is gonna be the, the time in hours, times the charge factor. And the charge factor is going to represent the, um, it, or is gonna be dependent on the partition. So Mahi talked about the partitions already. So as we know, we should be familiar with most of these. So we have nine partitions out there, seven of them. So the compute shared, GPU, GPU shared, large shared, debug, and GPU debug are all gonna have a charge factor of one. But with Expanse, we added these preempt and these preempt, um, the GPU preempt. And so these are discounted jobs that you can run on nodes that aren't previously allocated. But as discussed before, if another job comes into the queue and needs to use those, your job will be preempted. A couple things to keep in consideration. First, the good. In preempt queue, you can run for seven days, which is significantly larger than you can run in any of the others. But on the flip side of that, there are no refunds regardless. And um, the other thing to note is that in preempt, it's like a compute or a GPU request, you'll be charged for the entire core or the entire node. So we just, we allocate it in full nodes. So GPU charging, you can think of it kind of like a Tetris game. Um, when, we're, when we're scheduling, we're trying to fill in all those little spots. So um, there was some discussion before about if we allocate in node hours versus core hours. And one of the reasons we, we do core hours is because we feel that with the shared queue, we can fill in all those little back parts a little bit better. So again, part of the reason for having the preempt queue now is also that we can back fill in and fill in the empty spaces. So one expanse node has 128 cores and 256, 256 gigs of memory. This is different from Comet where it has 24 cores and 128 gigs of memory. So when you take the fraction of the smallest unit that we can allocate then is one expanse SU or one core hour is gonna be one core and up to two gigabytes of memory. Whereas on Comet, because we had fewer cores, even though we had less memory, per core you got a little bit more, you could get a little bit more memory. You could get up to five gigs of memory. Something that's really, really important to note at this point is that on in all partitions, unless you specify memory, you're gonna get a default of one gig of memory. That's across all the partitions. So again, if you just select, you just want to have, um, you're in shared and you want one or one core, by default is gonna put in one gig. So the charge here is fairly straightforward. Um, it's the equivalent of CPUs. So the equivalent of CPUs is either going, is going to be the number of cores or the memory that those cores have. So if you request one core and three gigabytes of memory, the three gigabytes of memory is gonna be more than worth one core, which means you pop into two 
into two cores. So you're going to be charged the equivalent of two CPUs for that. The, the wall clock time or the duration is going to be in hours. And then a charge factor, of course, is related to um, the partition that you use. GPU is, is very similar. So just to read, it's the GPUs, it, the charging is going to be the exact same. But again, you need to note that one GPU on Expanse is different than what we had on Comet. On Comet, we actually had two different types of GPUs available. But on, on, on Expanse, one GPU node has four GPUs, 40 cores, and three, uh, 384 gigabytes. So if you reduce or you take the fraction that will be down to the lowest um, portion of that node, you can have up to one, one GPU, up to 10 cores, and up to 96 gig, gigabytes of memory. So again, for GPUs, unless you specify differently, by default, if you request one GPU and don't add the other elements into your batch script, you're also only going to get one core and one gigabyte of memory. This, the equation here is similar, equivalent GPUs, job duration, charge factor. But again, the max is going to be out of GPUs, cores, or gigabytes of memory. So whichever has the most there is where it's going to fall in. So we talked a little about the, um, our, uh, Marty actually mentioned about uh, Expanse client tool we have. So the Expanse client tool replaces the, the tools, the tools we had on um, Comet, which was show accounts and project details. And what this tool will do for you. So basically, um, Marty also mentioned that to be able to run this command, you have to load the SDSC module. The syntax for this is expanse client and then the command that comes behind it. The commands you can use are either users or projects. When you list projects, it will give, it will, well, so when you use expanse client project, it you need to also specify the project that you wanna to view, but view. This will show you who all is on the allocation, what has been used, by each individual user, what, what the total is available to all the users. So in our account management system, we can actually specify percentage of allocation that's available or cap users at this. So that might be different depending in the example I have here, it actually, everyone in this allocation has the same amount available to them. And the final is what everyone, everyone combined has used on the project. The other um, command that you can use is users. And user will show you specifically what you have access to. So expansion module client user will show you all the allocations that you currently have available to you. And it will show you your usage. What's new with this tool is that we have a verbose option, which is really, really nice. So it doesn't only show you what, so the, our accounting updates into the database nightly. So everything that's been run today, if you go into the Expanse portal, you will only see information for all the jobs that were run yesterday or before then. You won't see what happened today because the, the jobs are uploaded at midnight. But with this tool, the two at the bottom here where you can see used queue and used by project queue, this will show you what is currently in the queue what is currently running and what has been run today. So that actually reconciles quite frequently. So you can, if you request a job to run for 24 hours on 128 nodes, it will show one thing, but if it pops in and pops out and um, immediately fails, and so it just runs for a second and only gets charged from an SU, that will drop down quickly for you. So I went, I went really quick and then I can, I can give some more things, but just in kind of a review, the charges are based on the reserved resources that you reserve and you request, not, not how you're gonna use it. The default uh, is of one gigabyte of memory per core GPU in all partitions. So it's really important that you designate in your scripts 
the dash with dash dash mem. The minimum, minimum charge for any job is one SU. A thing to note is that we drop the minimum, the time limit from 10 seconds to one second. So any job that runs for a second will get charged. I, I wrote down here again, the changes in the cores and what they are and that we have new partitions. Some of the, some of the partitions in the preempt, I think we're still considering how to best um, manage them and how to tweak them so that they are the most advantageous for our users. So I would recommend going to the user guide every once in a while, just in case we, we change anything. Um, that's all I have. I went very quickly and I know there's, there's stuff I forgot. So why don't I open it up to questions? Um, Are. Yeah, I think I think one of the questions that I was trying to answer uh, just now in the in the chat was um, in terms of maybe you can just review again the um, charging versus say cores and memories. Like, when are you charged more for one or the other? So depending, so we can actually there's we have a a, a little more complicated equation for that, but basically each. The, the smallest unit that you can request, or uh, I'll take the example of CPUs, is one core, and with that core, you can use up to two gigabytes of memory. So if you request, you can request five cores and two gigabytes of memory. And in that case, the, the number of cores is more than the amount of memory that five cores would have. So you're gonna be charged for the cores in that case. However, if you ask for one core and say six gigabytes of memory, six gigabytes of memory would actually correlate to, to three cores. So in that case, the, the memory is higher. So we're gonna charge you for three cores in that, in that aspect. Does that help at all? Yeah, I, th I think so. I mean, I think the question was, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a matter of essentially you have to think about the rule of thumb. I think I was saying in the, in the chat was, you know, you're going to be charged by the resource that you use more of over, say, the amount that's available on a per core basis. So as, as Nicole said, right, it's if you want, you know, for every core, there's effectively two gigabytes of memory available on the system. So if you need more than that, for a single core job, you're gonna be charged by the memory instead, because effectively you're taking that memory away from the other cores essentially. So it's that, that's the general rule of thumb, I think, right? Yeah, well, and I should also add why we, why we chose to set it at one gigabyte. So in, in a lot of cases, a lot, a lot of the applications don't need that much memory. However, some in the case with the example I gave you of one core and three gigabytes, it makes more sense to take advantage of someone who's using a core and one gigabyte example. Again, this is the test, the Tetris example. So we wanna fill in that little slot. Instead of taking another core away from someone else that could be using it, we can, we can use what's not being used. That makes sense. I see. Um, Okay, if there are any more questions, yeah, thanks, Nicole. I think we're running a little long. Um, so I think Suba is going to talk about the Expanse portal next. Yes, and uh, I can share my slides now? Yes. Okay. Okay, I can get started. Uh, everyone can see my slides. Yeah, it looks good. Okay. Hi, um, my name is um, Subha Sivanyanam. As uh, Mahidur mentioned in his talk uh, earlier today, we are developing a user portal for Expanse users. Um, so this is a very short talk. I will uh, just briefly describe the features of the portal and uh, show a quick demo. So the goal of the Expands user portal is to provide an integrated web-based environment for doing file management and uh, job submission operations on Expands. 
um, using an easy to use interface. The portal um, is also being developed to serve as a gateway for launching interactive applications such as um, you know, MATLAB and RStudio. Um, so we did not build this, um, you know, we're not building this portal from scratch. We are actually leveraging uh, an existing NSF funded project called Open On Demand, which uh, some of you may have heard of. And we're just customizing the software for working with um, the expense system. So the, um, the portal provides a graphical file management capability where um, users can view and operate on files in their home directory or on uh, Luster Scratch directory. Um, in addition to doing like basic file management operations like copying or moving, um, renaming and uploading files, users can now also edit files without needing a shell. There is a job composer area where um, users can create, um, edit, submit jobs and also monitor jobs. Uh, we do have, we have provided some predefined templates that, you know, users can use and they can customize it and um, submit jobs. We currently have example templates for um, jobs like MPI and OpenMP and we'll be adding more. But however, if you don't see a job template that, you know, you think would be widely used for a specific application or for a research community um, and you want that to be provided, please do let us know. The um, portal also allows the ability to submit an um, interactive job to the cluster. So, and without you know, needing to install a local X server. And as I mentioned, we currently we only have it for MATLAB and RStudio, but based on um, user requests, we may add more interactive applications. And for those users who need to access, uh, you know, who need a terminal, there is a, a integrated shell terminal with the portal and that's very similar to many other tools that provide um, terminal access. So now who can use the um, expense uh, portal? Is anyone, any PI or users who have a valid expense allocation and have the exceed base credentials, they can only access the um, expense portal. What that means is once your allocation is approved and you need to have your home directory and everything set up on the back end before you could use the um, expense portal. And um, though this is obvious, any policy like you know scheduler allocation usage, security policies that's been set on expense resource or any guidelines that has been established is automatically applicable when you're using the portal as well. So the portal is being developed and it will go into production along with the cluster. However, we did develop a prototype for Comet that's available if you're interested in checking it out, you can go to portal.comet.stsc, which is very similar to what we'll be providing for um, expense. So with that, I will um, quickly show a demo and I have only about 10 minutes. Um, Mary, is that right? Um, yes, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> um, so let me, uh, so, so as I mentioned, you need to have um, exceed portal username and password to log in. So you'll be automatically directed to the authentication page where you'll enter in your details and then you'll be redirected to our portal. So once in the portal, you can see um, on the top um, navigation bar, it, you know, it's pretty uh, exploratory, but it's, it's just, you can access your files or you can go for the job composer area. If you want the terminal, it's under the clusters and you can use the um, interactive apps to launch your interactive job on the cluster. So I'll just um, show the, um, my home directory. So this is my home directory on Expanse. And this is the file, uh, graphical file management tool. And here I can, um, view files, I can edit files, um, I can um, you know, move and rename or create a new file in a directory, I can do all those operations here. And I can just uh, show you, you know, how just a basic edit. So this is my submit script and I can, you know, maybe I want to print out the date in addition to running this job. So I can do that and if I save it, it gets saved. Um, and then, I'm sorry, the zoom bar, I can't see where the tab is, um, I have to go back. So you, as you can see now, um, the edits would be saved and I can view the changes here um, and I can submit this job using the uh, job submission interface. So the under the jobs, they, there is an active job and a job composer tabs. The active jobs is where once you have submitted a job, you can come here to monitor the status, you know, if it's waiting in the queue, you can look at it and you can also look at, essentially it gives you the output of S control show job and that's what it will be listed over there. Uh, the job composer is where 
you would um, actually create your job scripts and submit it to the cluster. And if you're interested in using the templates, there is a template tab that you can even tap, you can access on the top or through the, uh, through the button. And right now we have a basic hello world. There's an MPI job, there's an open MP. And if you want to use any of these existing templates to start the work, you can just you know, click on create new job and that's created. And you can see the job script itself over here. And if you want to make any changes, right? So if you want to add your account information, um, if you want to add, if, if you want to modify the scripts, you can do so by opening the editor and saving it. And for the interest of time, let me just show you a job that has been completed. So this is a job that I um, um, ran yesterday. And as you can see, you know, the output is just to print a hello world and it did that. Um, so in addition to uh, creating and submitting job scripts, you can also run interactive uh, jobs. And right now I'll just show a quick example of you running a MATLAB job. Um, here you can um, choose your queue, the number of hours, what account you want to use or where you want to launch the job from. And I will, for this demo, I'll just launch it from my scratch, my Luster scratch directory. And um, I'm just running it for one hour. And once it's queued, you will show it'll show up here. And you can launch multiple such interactive sessions. And you can um, there is a tab where you can go view all your launched interactive sessions in under my interactive session. Right now the job is running. And um, for some reason, let's say you're debugging with a colleague or you want to uh, you want them to see what you're doing, you can share, you can give them a view only shareable link. Um, to, so they can also watch what you are doing. And so once if I launch the job, it opens up um, the, oh, now it's failed to connect the server. Um, let me see. I'm sorry, I am not sure what's going on. I'll have to debug this one, but once you would, it will open up an, um, an interactive terminal where the MATLAB will be launched and you can uh, plot and display and open your MATLAB files and, um, and uh, use the interactive application there. And if there is time, I, I will show, I will try to see what's going on and I'll, I can even show this on Comet as well as how it's working. Um, so other than that, if you're interested in using the uh, terminal shell access, there is an integrated shell and which you can use to log in and, um, and it's, uh, you can just use that for, and it's just a basic like a putty shell and if you don't want to install putty, you can use this one. So this is the um, portal in a nutshell. We will be adding more um, um, features such as, you know, where your information about your job and information about your allocations will also be displayed here. And we will um, also be adding more interactive applications as there is a demand. So with that, um, um, I'll end my talk and uh, see if you have any questions. So, so there, was, <clears throat> there was one in the chat about whether there's a REST API for uh, OOD. For OOD? Um, no, we don't uh, have a REST API for OOD, for the portal. Okay, thanks, Suba. So uh, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, and let's see if I can make this work. There we go. Does everybody see um, the talk? Yep. Okay. Um, Go ahead and turn off my video. All right, so I'm gonna talk about um, interactive computing, which is a subset of the user portal. Um, so Suba just talked about the, the portal and there's a lot of different definitions for interactive computing. So today I'll just talk about um, a couple of tools we're working with. And um, as Suba was saying, there'll be other uh, interactive tools brought onto Expanse. So what's interactive computing? Basically, when I type on my keyboard and I work interact with my computer, I'm doing interactive computing. But it's a little bit different as you 
gathered and if you've worked on HPC systems, it's a little bit different when you're trying to do this on uh, a high performance computer and in particular on the um, compute nodes, you have to get them allocated, you have to get your hands on them and you have to be able to work on them. So what, there's a lot of um, work being done in the, the field of interactive computing on HPC systems. There's actually an annual workshop that uh, is being held. I think it's in conjunction with supercomputing on um, interactive HPC systems. So, uh, so with that, here are some scenarios for HPC, uh, interactive HPC, um, in MATLAB, parallel MATLAB, like Suba just showed you. And, and on Expanse, uh, we want you to use it through the portal so it can be well maintained and, and um, you get good, better performance. There's Jupyter Notebooks, which I'll talk about today. Uh, and then there's um, Amazon has an application for um, um, some scientific application looking at airflow monitoring. So anytime you're running an application and you're accessing a cluster node, it's interactive HPC computing. So to get an interactive node, you have to run a particular command. So interactive nodes are particular uh, nodes that when you get it, you'll be able to actually, you'll be logged onto it and you'll be able to run commands. That's where you can grab an interactive node and you can compile and, de and debug code a little bit. We don't want you running your application on the login node, but if you need to do things on the command line, like your compiling takes a really long time, then you, you can do it on an interactive node. And, it, and um, in the future, there will be a full partition dedicated to interactive, uh, but that's not up and running yet. Um, so this is some of the arguments. I think you might've seen them earlier. The big change between Comet and Expanse is you have to give it the account information. And as Marty pointed out, the, the arguments to, um, to Slurm are a lot more exacting. So you have to give a little bit more information. These two work on the CPU and the GPU. And if you need help developing other interactive requests, um, let us know. And so um, I'm gonna focus on um, Jupyter Notebooks um, and running them on, on um, Expanse. So Jupyter is a, a, a open source tool that there are two really popular um, applications. There, Jupyter Notebooks and Jupyter Lab, and they're actually considered services, and I'll show you why. And, and understanding that will help you realize um, a, a key aspect we're trying to focus on, which is the security of these notebooks. So um, we have a tutorial on uh, running notebooks on Comet that will be ready for Expanse as well. So for more details, my talk kind of follows this very loosely. Um, but go to that tutorial um, if you have questions. So normally if you're gonna run notebooks, you, you can run it on your laptop and um, notebooks are popular in a lot of different scenarios, especially machine learning. You can run parallel notebooks. You need to use something like Spark. And um, there's a lot of applications that are, are using them. So Anaconda is great, but it's big and heavyweight. So we don't want to run that on an HPC node. So what we recommend is that you use the um, mini Anaconda environment called Conda. And so you can go to the tutorials and um, find out de more detailed um, explanations or go to the Conda site to install it. But the, the power of Conda installing it is it gives you your own local environment. So you can install the version of Python uh, like Marty was showing you with modules, it's very similar. Uh, it was originally created for Python. And so you can, you can also de develop your own Conda environments and then have different versions of Python in those environments. Um, so it gives you a lot of flexibility and control for what you're doing. So we um, intentionally want people to use Conda because that way we're not trying to keep different versions of Conda environments maintained for 10,000 users. The users will teach you to install Conda, make your own environment, and then you'll have a lot more um, control over how your applications are running. Um, so you want to, um, you can also create these virtual environments. I won't, I won't do a demo of that. Um, and you can look on the Conda site, but this is one way that you do it. You create the environment, you install the particular modules that you need, uh, and off you go. To, to install um, Conda, we have long uh, full instructions on the tutorial. 
but but it, it can take a long time, just a warning. It takes a long time to install all that software. If you want to use Jupyter Notebooks, you need to install the notebooks and you need to install Jupyter Lab. It's pretty straightforward, but again, it can take um, five, 10 minutes for these to install. Uh, so, and then you want to make sure that the environment is working. Um, so um, a, a key issue that we're addressing at, at SDSC is the security of Jupyter Notebooks. Probably a lot of you have already run Jupyter Notebooks and you're thinking, why do I need to be taught about this? But most of the time when you run a notebook, they're not secure, it's HTTP. By default, Jupyter launches without security. There are some ways to make it more secure and that's what we're trying to work on today. Um, so there are vulnerabilities. In fact, the portal that um, Suba presented to you, um, the team spent the last year um, improving the security model. So uh, we're working on that with um, our security experts, Scott Sakai and some other people. So um, why, why is this a problem? The connection by default is not secure. You can connect over SSH tunneling. It's secure and we have a little tutorial and we have no problem with that, but it's inconvenient and things happen like um, you, your connection may time out and you lose your notebook. So it's not the, the best way. So we've been trying to find something a little more optimal and we came up with this idea of a reverse proxy service. So I'll show you how that works. And then um, Marty's been developing Galileo, which is a remote notebook launcher that would run off your laptop. Hopefully we can work on that and roll it out next year. So we allow Jupyter services, that's Jupyter Notebook and Jupyter Lab to run on interactive nodes, on the compute nodes, on GPU nodes. Um, so what's wrong with the default Jupyter Notebook? It helps to understand that you're on your laptop, you SSH over to uh, the uh, server, whichever it could be the login node, which we don't want you to do, or even um, the, the, the remote um, node that you get with an interactive command. The Jupyter service launches, and it's a web server basically running at, for you on that node, but it's HTTP. So you have a secure SSH connection. Everything you type there is protected, but the, the, the connection between your web browser and Jupyter is insecure, which means it can be hacked. And so we're trying to overcome that by making this a little more secure. SSH tunneling works this way. What you do is you connect, you set up the tunneling by making a, a proxy connection between uh, using the port uh, you set up a port on your laptop, a port on the Jupyter Notebook, and then an SSH connection between that port on your laptop and that port on the notebook, and everything communicated here, it's secure. But like I said, if you have some interruption, these things have a way of timing out, of um, getting disruptive. It's not very stable, but it, it works, and we're fine with you using that. Um, so what's more secure is what we've architected in called the reverse proxy service. So um, you log in to Comet and you, you run a script and the script will go and um, submit a request to the batch queue, grab an interactive node for you, launch your Jupyter service, either notebook or lab, and, and communicate with a reverse proxy service. And what you get back is an HTTP connection. So everything you do is encrypted. Um, that's just basically, you know, um, in, in um, um, repeating what's in that diagram. The start Jupyter script is what you're going to run. You'll check it out and clone it from the repository. And you have arguments. You can tell the partition you want, what directory you want it to start in, the project allocation, the batch script. Do you want to use notebook or a Jupyter lab? Right now you have to tell it a little more explicitly, but we're working on improving that part of the user interface, how long you want it to run, and um, you can get extra information about the job um, as, you, as we build the script and submit it. So to um, install it, you know, I usually put it in a little working directory. You clone the repository and it gets installed and then you come down into the directory and you'll see this script here. We've generalized the, the service so that um, it can work for systems that have Slurm or Torque, which means it works on Comet, Expanse, TSCC, Stratus, and, um, and we can just add, all we have to do is develop the right notebook 
configuration um, for the particular service. So you're just going to run this. You, all you have to do is run that script and the defaults will get picked up. Here's an example of um, starting it. You'll get some output. And one of the things that comes out is your notebook is here. So you want to copy that URL, paste it into a web browser, and you'll be given a monitoring window. And when it's finally launched, and that can take some time because the queuing system might be very busy, you'll get your notebook or your, your browser. And this is over here is just a little example of um, the, the script uh -oh, going the wrong way. And um, this is an example of using the Expanse portal to launch the notebook. So you log in and you pick um, a terminal window. And so what you get is a shell. And there's a link on this um, portal when you first log in. And you're in your shell. And what I did is I went into my reverse proxy and I typed start Jupiter, and by default, that's going to launch a notebook for me. And I got back um, a URL, I pasted it in and I monitored it, and then it ran. And so eventually, but it can take a while for it to run. So um, you can do it through the portal, or you can do this through the command line, whichever you want. Um, and I think I'm in, in my time. Yeah, I think we still have time. All right, thank you. That's it if you have any questions. Uh, if you have, a, this is a new um, product, a new application. So if you discover problems with it, please um, submit a ticket to um, Exceed Consult so we can um, make it work better. And that's it, thank you. Thanks, Mary. That was great. Um, and last but not least, thanks everyone for hanging in there. Uh, Nicole Walter will share some details on data transfer mechanisms. Sorry. I'm sorry, I just saw that. I apologize. So for this final thing, we'll talk about data storage and transferring. Um, I'm going to do a quick overview of the storage we have available and the policies that are associated with it. I know that Mahi has discussed this previously, but it is a pretty big change. And so I, I think it's important that we, we, we drive it home to you that, that, it's, gonna, that it's coming. Um, and then I'll talk about some various options and tools that are going to help you manage um, how, how to manage the data you have. All right, so like on Comet, we have the home file system and then we have the parallel global file system. The home file system, uh, similar to Comet, uh, all users will get one. You will have 100 gigs of data there. I think both Marty and Mahi mentioned that this should only be used for, for scripts, maybe source trees, maybe binaries, um, static stuff that you want to keep forever. You should never run jobs from the home, the home file system. One of it is that your performance isn't going to be that good. Um, so instead, we, we recommend you use the parallel file systems. We have uh, the Scratch and projects, as Scratch indicates, this is supposed to be temporary. On Comet, we recommended that it should be less than three months or less than 90 days. On Expanse, we're going we're gonna to help remind you that this is Scratch, and we're going to automate that purge to help everyone. And it's going to be 90, 90 days from file creation. The other option we have, so again, any files that you have there that need to be in a little Bit more permanent place should go into projects. Project, projects is actually allocated space, but all projects will by default get 500 gigs of memory. If you want any additional uh, or if you need additional space, as Mahi mentioned, you're going to need to justify it and either put it in your initial proposal or request a supplement. The other really, really important thing is that the, the Lustre file system does not have backups. 
So all the tools I'm gonna to talk, about, talk about after this, um, please take advantage of them so that we never have a, um, a problem of that I've lost all my data. Um, since we know that we're not supposed to use login nodes, we shouldn't use login nodes for uh, any compute or IO intensive. And the IO intensive is of course, including moving large amounts of data. So we have four data mover nodes and they're there specifically to help you guys transfer data back and forth. Um, the data mover nodes can be used with all the tools that I'm gonna discuss further. Um, when you access, uh, or you can access the data mover nodes with oasis-dm.sdsc.edu. I think that name might change, but at this time when you go in there, uh, you'll it's load balanced so that it'll round drop into one of the four nodes. So there's, um, of the tools we have available, uh, this kind of a list we have out there, when you're deciding on what tool to use, it's really gonna depend on the amount of data you have. So that includes both um, the size of the individual files and the number of files that you're moving. Other things that you kind of wanna take into consideration is your workflow and if you need to be able to script any of these things. So if it's gonna be scripted, you need, need a clamp command line interface. So for, for smaller moves, you can use SV, SCP or rsync or SFFTP. For larger, um, for larger things, as Mahi mentioned, the, the Globus Toolkit, we have a couple tools there and different places where you can use that from and how you can use it. Um, in addition, we're kind of adding two new tools that into our, into our idea here. Because we're getting into the cloud a little bit more, you might be needing to move stuff off into archival storage. These two tools, these tools are very robust and can help with other things. So we'll start with the small files. So for small files less than two gigabits, you can use SCP, SFTP, or, or rsync, but we'll, let's focus on the top two first. So SCP is secure copy protocol is a utility for secure file transfer. Um, SFTP, as Marty gave us a great example earlier, is secure file transfer protocol. It has a utility with a bit more functionality. So not only can you transfer files, you can also access files and you can do some um, file management in there. Um, with all these tools, there are lots of options of how you can use. I, I highly recommend, again, due to time, I'm, I'm, I'm cutting this very brief, but I recommend on the system, you do SCP help or command help and it'll give you all the, all the options that are available to you. Another thing to consider with these is that you can copy from a, a local site to a remote site, from a remote site back to your local site, or between two remote sites. Last tool I'm going to talk about kind of for these small is rsync. So rsync is going to be useful if you, if you want to kind of maintain two equal copies on, a different, on two different systems. Um, the difference the nice thing about rsync is it's not going to copy the entire file. It's just going to copy the changes that are happening. So it's a little less overhead for you. Um, the next three tools I'm going to talk about um, are, are rely on the Globus Toolkit. The Globus Toolkit is a collection of clients and middleware that is designed specifically for enabling technology for grid computing. So essentially allows secure communication between grid grid users that cross organizational boundaries. Um, it's a command line, command line tool that supports the standard SSH and grid. Um, so you can use this in the single sign-on hub, but that's, that's what it's using. It uses G, GSI SSH to interface with, Glo with Globus. The transfer tools that are in there are GSI SCP and GSI FTP, and they're essentially the same as SCP and F SFTP. The one thing with all the Globus tools is that you're going to need an exceed an active an active that's important exceed allocation. If you are a local user who only has a local allocation, feel free to contact us. Um, in addition, if your account has expired at this time, I believe if your your allocation is over, um, exceed cuts you off. I, they, I, I believe they were talking about changing that, so there was a little bit of a leeway. But in case that's still the case, you should contact us either through the Exceed ticketing system or the SDSC local ticketing system. 
and we'll help facilitate it so that you can move your data as needed. Um, if you're uncomfortable with the command line, you can use Globus via GUI. Um, you'll log into www.globus.org. You're going to use your Exceed credentials to get in there. Uh, the endpoints are important, so you can see um, the collection is where you will select your endpoints. If you just type, start typing Exceed, it'll give you a full list of everything's in there, and you can pick and choose. Another thing to keep in mind is that the paths in Globus or on the data mover nodes are a little different than what is actually on the system itself. So um, check in the in the user guide to to find how those paths how they correlate between them. Uh, the next one I'm going to talk about is Globus URL copy. This can be done on the the data mover nodes. It's a control line command line interface for high-speed data transfers. It also uses the grid FTP tool. So this is um, we this is really recommended for large files and large number of files. So do a little segue here. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. If you have a large number of really small files, it is highly recommended that you tar them up and send them as one large file rather than lots of little files. So to use Globus URL copy, once you're on the data mover nodes, you need to load the Globus module. You need to check to make sure you have an active user proxy. Um, the command is uh, uh, grid proxy info. It can tell you if it's available, how long, it'll be, how long it's available. By default, I think the certificates last for 12 hours. If you don't have one, you can use the, um, the command my proxy logon to create a new certificate for yourself. Again, the help dash dash help will give you all the, the parameters to, to help you improve performance and to make this as efficient as possible. Um, I should take a moment and note that the, the Globus toolkit can be up to eight times faster than using SCP for large files and like the terabytes and stuff. However, it should also be noted that if you're doing really small files, it's actually better to use SCP because the grid tools will take longer because the overhead associated with them. So now I'm going to talk about two, two tools that I am by no means uh, fully versed in all their capabilities. These are two extremely robust tools that are way beyond just copying files. The first one is, the, is IBM Aspera. And the, the tool or the command that we use is AF, ASCP. It uses a fast FASP technology to transfer and share files. It does a whole lot more. So it, it, I mean, it's for big data transport and syncing. You can send, you can share with this. Um, it also helps with automation. And again, this can be used for, for, for uh, the cloud stuff as well. Um, I have a simple example here that that's just kind of the high level but again lots more information lots more functionality that's available with this tool and you can find that at the at the link pro provided below um the ibm spara copy tool is available is is currently available on the the data mover nodes so the aws um, command line interface is not available yet you would need to download it to use it However, the, the um, instructions and is, is super simple. So it comes down, it takes a little bit, little bit of time because it's a larger thing, but it is very simple. It's an open source tool to interact with the AWS services using commands in your command line shell. It'll use Linux, you can use it with Windows as well. It uses FTP or FTPS or SFTP to transfer stuff. Um, Again, it's a very, very robust tool. There's a lot more options available out there and you can find them by going on the web and checking it out. So we will start with back up all your data. I remind you that we, we don't back up the Lustre file system. So it's really important that you take it upon yourselves to back up the data. And then kind of in, re in review, there's lots of tools available on Expanse for data transfer. 
how you choose which tools to use is going to depend on the size of the files, the numbers of files, and, and what your workflow is. You should always avoid moving uh, a lot of small files. There's an automated purge on the Lustre file system. So again, back up your data. <laughs> and finally, I, we haven't meant, well, we have mentioned that a comet's going to go away at the end of March, which means its file system will go away in mid-April. So we strongly encourage you, if you have a lot of data, to start thinking about where that data get, data is going to go. Something else that I should, should mention that's a difference between Comet and all the resources before and Expanse is that Comet loaded, had the same uh, home directory and actually loaded, I think, the, the file systems from previous. We aren't doing that with Expanse. So anything in your home directory, if you want it on Expanse, you, um, if it was on Comet, you're going to need to copy it over. So, and I think that's all I have. Are there any, any questions or? Stop sharing and check the, oh, check the, oh, lots. Yes. Um, Hey everybody, I guess we're done and we're gonna end on time, which is always good. Somebody asked about um, the presentations, so I'll post this again in the chat, but uh, we'll have everything um, uploaded in, as PDFs in this directory. So um, thank you very much for attending. We really appreciate it and hope you found this helpful. We'll repeat it again in the spring before Comet shuts down. Send us questions, send questions to help at exceed.org if you have questions, consult or help at exceed.org if you have any other questions. Anybody have any comments or questions? Go ahead. I just want to add that this being a three hour recording means it'll take a, a day or two at least to clean up the transcript and get it online and we'll make the chat available and the slides as well. And there will also be a link. Ah, there's the link to the GitHub repository and that'll be populated with additional resources as well. So thanks very much everyone for hanging in there. Uh, thanks to the presenters. Thanks to the, the team for helping out on the chat too. Have a great day. Yeah, have a great day folks. Bye. Thanks.